Hello. Let's talk about Gotham. Some years ago, I posted on Facebook about watching the new season of Gotham as they are on TV. A friend of mine asked in the comments, should I watch Gotham? I had a hard time coming up with a straight answer to that question. I'd watched the show since its premiere and I'd seen every episode, but I recognized it was one of the wildest shows that I'd ever watched. Uh, it tries to walk this line between supervillain silliness and gritty realism. It's obviously based on Batman, but Batman isn't a character in the show. It had consistently great performance and execution paired with really loony story. I wasn't even sure if I could recommend it to Batman fans just because of the liberty that it took with the source material. Ever since that moment, I've thought about Gotham and what a crazy experience it was watching it and trying to come up with an answer to the question, is this a good show? Regardless of where I fall, Regardless of where I fall, I've obviously been moved to think about and talk about what transpired over the course of the series. If nothing else, I feel like I need to share where this show started, where it went, and how it ultimately ended up. To the Batman fans and the non-Batman fans out there, I'd say it's a pretty remarkable show one way or the other. So we've come here today to learn, maybe answer some questions. Is this a good show? Do I like this show? Let's have a discussion as we talk about what the hell is going on in Gotham. So I want to begin with a primer before we dig into Gotham proper. I'm a Batman fan from way back in the day. My first Bat memories are watching the Batman 66 Adam West show. I'm not that old. They were in syndication reruns at the time. Later on, Batman the Animated Series became a seminal work in my life and after that, I watched most of the Batman adaptations that came along. You might have noticed I didn't mention the comics. Oh, you know, it's true. Most of my exposure to you know, superhero genre in general was through adaptations on animated series or video games or whatnot. For some reason, I just never came across the comics much as a kid. So, fake fan right here. But Batman is probably my favorite superhero. There's legitimately times where I'll find myself pondering a situation. I ask myself, well, what would Batman do? So fast forward several years, and there's word going around that a Batman-adjacent TV show is being developed for Fox. It would be a police procedural based around Gotham City. And so my mind immediately went to, oh, they're doing Gotham Central. They're doing GCPD show. How interesting. It sounds like a great idea for network TV. You know, network TV loves their police procedurals and then you get to put a superhero spin on it. What's it like to be a regular police officer but sometimes you have to work with Batman to solve a case? Uh, what's it like when you're technically working with a criminal yourself to help fight crime in the city? What's it like when you're, again, a regular police officer but there's supervillains planning to like blow up a dam or something? To me, that sounded like real fertile ground for a network television show, and I was excited. But then more details started coming out. As we learned more, we found out a young James Gordon would be our main character before he became commissioner. Okay, I thought, maybe we can get a fresh take on Gotham City before it went really crazy. Maybe before there were full costume villains running about the city, there were just like extra flamboyant mobsters or something. We can see the seeds of what would become the Gotham City that we know that's a little bit more grounded and accessible for, you know, your average network TV watcher. And then we heard more. We found out that a young Bruce Wayne would also be a character on the show. Now I was starting to get concerned. Oh, this was starting to turn into a Batman origin story, and not in the good way like you want. Probably in large part due to Batman Begins, Around this time, there was a lot of origin stories coming up for properties that didn't necessarily need them. Especially for Batman, whose origins are well known at this point, it seemed unnecessary to spend so much time with Bruce pre-Batman. I know that people will point to Smallville. Yeah, that show ran for a long time. I never saw that one, so I can't speak to it. But, you know, that seemed to do pretty well, so you know maybe there's still hope. Then we heard more. 
As the show was being produced, we heard about the larger cast of characters. We found out the show would include James Gordon in the lead. We also found out there would be Bruce Wayne and Alfred, Harvey Bullock, another cop of the GCPD, Leslie Tompkins, who was traditionally a med school classmate of Thomas Wayne and eventually becomes like Batman's personal doctor, Oswald Cobblepot, who'd be a low-level criminal, Edward Nigma, who'd be working in the GCPD crime lab, and a young Selina Kyle. So I was like, oh, you just want to make a Batman show without Batman. I was starting to get concerned. It was sounding less and less like a novel take and more like Batman light. But it's Batman. I have to watch it. I'd have to watch it to see how it goes. I mean, we're getting a Batman-ish TV show on network TV. That's something to celebrate, usually. And you never know how it'll go. You know, something can look one way on paper, but be different in the execution. It was worth it to see what went down. So let's gather our courage and dive in. Obviously, spoiler alert for the entire run of Gotham, and maybe some comics, but come on. It's really for the whole show. Also, I wanna put out a blanket content warning here for the rest of the video. This is a very violent show. It's like really cartoony in that violence, but it's still violent. I'm gonna be talking about a lot of violent, messed up things in frankly a pretty flippant way. So this is just a heads up. I'm gonna be discussing cartoon levels of violence, but in a live action setting that makes it a little bit more messed up. Season one. So since we're starting in this you know, Batman origin story really, it actually affords us with a really interesting opportunity. In this time period, we can actually get to know the Waynes before they die. We know that Thomas and Martha Wayne die, and that sets young Bruce on his path to becoming Batman. You know, seeing that go down is practically de rigueur at this point. Take it and go. I said you were. I'll take that necklace you're wearing, lady. Leave her alone. Thomas! Haven't they exploited that poor rich Wayne family enough? Every few years there's another film depicting the Wayne's murder. <laughs> we get it. Crime Alley, the pearls, those pearls. But that's usually all we get, them dying. Since we're doing a TV series, we can actually get to know them a bit and who they are as people and as parents to Bruce. What is Thomas Wayne like? Who is this guy who has generational wealth but still goes to med school and decides to become a doctor? Who is this guy who runs all these companies, presumably that he inherited from his family, but still seems to keep a level head on his shoulders. What's Martha Wayne like? You know, from most accounts, she also comes from a wealthy background. She marries into the Wayne family and you know, they run all these charities and philanthropies. What are they like? The Waynes are usually portrayed as like royalty in Gotham. You know, they're celebrities in the city. So what is it like to, to live that life like that? And usually they're portrayed as, you know, still being pretty good people despite all of this. I think that's really interesting ground to cover. Imagine you get a whole first season 
with the uh, Waynes going around doing stuff with the knowledge that by the end of the first season they will die, but you get to know them along the way so that death is felt even more. This show doesn't do that though. The Waynes die in the very first scene. The necklace. It's okay. Easy. Oh well. Yes, I know there's another show out there called Pennyworth that has an even younger Thomas and Martha Wayne in it that might cover some of this ground, but I have not seen that show, so maybe that's a better place to find that kind of information. Check it out if you're interested, though. The Waynes are shot and killed in Crime Alley, the way they usually are, but there's an extra wrinkle to the story this time. There's another witness to the murder besides Bruce. It's a young Selena Kyle who's hanging out on the fire escape of a building for some reason and sees the murder go down. This makes Selena way more important than in young Bruce's life than she ever normally would be at this time. Also, it changes the narrative a little bit about the Wayne's death. Usually the killer is never caught, justice is never served. But now that somebody else has seen it, maybe there's a chance that things can go a little bit differently this time around. Now, I want to take a moment before we go on. Since this is a modern TV drama, is it a drama? This show won't be too shy about killing off characters. There are some characters that we know are probably going to make it because of their importance in the larger Batman myth mythos, but everyone else is pretty much fair game to die at some point. And since, by law, the Waynes had to die to set this story in motion, I wanted to honor their sacrifice and those yet to come. So, this is the Thomas and Martha Wayne Memorial Death Board, where we will honor those whose death made this show possible. Anyway, the Waynes are dead, Bruce is alive, and Selena witnessed the murder. We meet new Gotham City Police Department detective Jim Gordon and his partner Harvey Bullock, and they're on the case and the show is underway. Immediately the show steers right into the realm of organized crime, not an unfamiliar topic for Batman, but oh boy, pack a picnic basket because we're going to be here for a while. Bullock starts the investigation by going to a mob connection of his named Fish Mooney. Now, I want to take a moment here to recognize Fish Mooney is played by Jada Pinkett Smith. We knew about this casting going into the show, and I thought it was great. I wanted to see characters introduced who weren't necessarily bound to any pre-existing canon. Then, we don't know what to expect. Plus, having a notable actor in that role is great for publicity and getting the word out to new fans. So, when Fish Mooney shows up in the pilot, I was confused. Jada Pinkett Smith is going so big here. Her choice as an actor are so big and noticeable that you clock it right away. Harvey. <laughs> Fish. Where has you been? Well, 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 Detectives Montoya and Allen. To what do I owe this honor? Boy! Sorry. If you let this hair go frizzy, you will be. Out! Everyone out! Then where's my money? Your deductive powers astonish me. Honestly, I just gotta chill. I am gonna kill that old man with my bare hands and my teeth. Now, I'm not here to mock Jada Pinkett Smith. I know what happens when you do that. On the contrary, I owe her a kind of a metaphysical apology for thinking back in the day that she showed up to be on a different show. Her performance seems odd up front here, but in hindsight, I think that Jada Pinkett Smith knew what show she was on way before anybody else did. 
there's some wild stuff coming up and she seemed to know this before anybody did. So Jada Pinkett Smith understood the assignment. Anyway, Bullock ends up getting a tip from Fish Mooney that it was a guy named Mario Pepper who killed the Waynes. You know, famous DC villain Mario Pepper. Gordon and Bullock track him down and confront him, and there's a struggle, and they end up shooting and killing him almost immediately. And if you think it's wild that the police end up killing a suspect within minutes of meeting him, you are in for a wild ride on this show. Now, it seems that the case is wrapped up in the very first episode, but Oswald Cobblepot, who is the umbrella boy for Fish Mooney, gives Crispus Allen and Rene Montoya a tip. Now, Allen and Montoya are internal affairs agents who are keeping an eye on the Wayne murder investigation, and Oswald tips them off that Mario Pepper was framed for the murder. This information really quickly gets right back to Gordon. Now, Rene Montoya and Crispus Allen are important DC Comics characters you would think would fit right into this GCPD show, but I'm going to forget about them right here. They only pop up a few more times in season one and then disappear forever. But just to give them the propers, they were on the show. Gordon tries to confront Mooney about the bad tip, but he's immediately captured by the mob and Mooney plans to kill him. And he's only saved by an intervening Carmine Falcone. Quick aside, I'm, I think no one's ever properly sure how to pronounce Falcone, whether it's Falcone or Falcone. I think they said Falcone in the animated series, so I'm just going to go with that for the rest of the video. So Falcone is the big mob boss of the town right now, and apparently he was friendly with Gordon's dad back in the day, so he's going to save him. However, they're going to kill Oswald for tipping off the cops about the Mario Pepper thing, and they're going to have Gordon do it so they have some leverage over him going forward since he's a new police officer. So Gordon's in a little bit of a pickle here, so he takes Oswald off to the end of a pier and he pretends to shoot him and he sort of sotto voce tells him to leave Gotham and never return and then throws him in the river. So it seems like he shot and killed him. So that's our setup for the show. The Waynes die, the mob try to sweep it under the rug but fail, uh, the police are corrupt and Gordon vows to find the real killers. He talks to Bruce Wayne and tells them that he will find the, the true killers because it's out now that it wasn't really Mario Pepper. So you have all your setups for an area appropriate drama. Overarching mystery, secret family connections, a lot of murder. We should be off to the races. Now in later seasons, uh, the marketing folks over at Gotham would adopt subtitles on the seasons or portions of seasons to kind of denote what the overarching theme of that season was. They didn't do that in season one, but in retrospect, I think I personally would call it Gotham mob shenanigans because that's what I ended up writing in my notes over and over again. Especially in the first half of the season, there's a lot of jockeying back and forth in the mob trying to, to gain power and leverage, but it, it's frankly pretty uninteresting in retrospect. Uh, but here's the important points to know. Carmine Falcone is the big boss of the city and he's actually in league with the mayor, Aubrey James. Sal Maroney is his chief rival and wants to overthrow him. Fish Mooney works under Sal Maroney, but mostly wants to overthrow Maroney. You could actually really use an org chart here to show how everybody is related to everybody else, but it's too uninteresting and I didn't bother. Uh, the main point is everybody is jockeying to be the big crime boss in the city and everybody switches alliances whenever it's convenient to do so. A couple other things to mention right out. Uh, Jim Gordon is engaged to a woman named Barbara Keene. Uh, they just moved back to Gotham when Gordon got the GCPD job. She seems nice enough, but it seems like she may have a dark secret past. Also, Edward Nigma, yeah, that Edward Nigma, works in the GCPD forensics department. He seems okay, but a little bit weird. So on to our day-to-day -day of the show. Uh, remember how Selina Kyle witnessed the Wayne's murder and how important that would make her in the story going forward? Well, about that, I believe episode two is about kids getting abducted off the street by the doll maker. Uh, you don't see him, but he's name dropped by the people who are doing the snatching. Gordon gets caught up in the case and he rescues Selina as one of the kids who was kidnapped 
and talks to her about this evidence she has about the Wayne murder. Um, however, over the next few episodes, it's revealed she didn't really see anything particularly actionable or useful with the murder. So that thread is dropped dead right there. It mostly just serves to introduce her as somebody who is important to Bruce Wayne going forward. So that's done. Oh, and remember Gordon told Cobblepot to never return to Gotham? He comes back to Gotham in about three episodes. Um, he aligns with Maroney to overthrow Falcone now, or does he? And during the pilot, when he was assaulted by the mob, his leg was injured and never properly treated. So it gives him a kind of a limp or maybe a waddle for the rest of the show that earns him the nickname, The Penguin. Since Penguin is back in town, Falcone knows that Gordon didn't actually kill him and sends a few notable thugs after him. Victor Zaz and Butch Gilzean. Now you might recognize the name Victor Zaz as a serial killer who keeps tally marks on his body for each person that he kills. He's totally different in this show and really just functions as a sort of hitman for hire for whoever needs to use him. There isn't really much to say about him, but he's played fantastically by Anthony Kerrigan, so it's a high point in the show. Then there's Butch, not an established DC character, or is he? But he's someone we'll be spending a lot of time with going forward. Since being targeted by the mob can be stressful on a relationship, Gordon and Barbara break up. Barbara bounces around a little bit. She goes back to be with Renee Montoya, who is apparently her ex. But soon after, uh, Renee kicks her out as well uh, because she seems to be a little bit off. Overall, there's more mob shenanigans. Uh, Penguin is revealed to have been working with Falcone all along and he's now infiltrated Moroni's operation as an inside man for Falcone. And since uh, Falcone controls the mayor, they have Jim framed for a murder, not Penguin's murder, a different murder. And they have him reassigned from the GCPD to be a guard at Arkham Asylum, which I'm pretty sure the mayor wouldn't be able to do. Like, I don't think they would have that kind of oversight over like staffing in the police department necessarily, like going to an insane asylum. Also, uh, you, you would think there'd be like different training and requirements to be a prison, what amounts to a prison guard over like a police detective, but whatever. So we're 10 episodes into season one and Gordon has already been kicked off the GCPD. This doesn't amount to much as it just takes a couple episodes for Gordon to get back into the GCPD. But while he's at Arkham, he does meet Dr. Leslie Tompkins and she goes by Lee. They get along so well that Lee ends up going to work at the GCPD once Gordon goes back as well. Another side to Falcone's big moves in the city is a fish Mooney ends up fleeing. She leaves the city by boat. She sets out to sea and is immediately captured by mercenaries who seem to kidnap her. This seems like it comes out of nowhere, but don't worry, we'll get back to that later. In the back half of season one, we get a lot more lore stuff. Uh, Gordon investigates some a murderer who seems to be targeting members of a phobia support group. Sounds like someone we know might be involved in something like that. Sure enough, the culprit is Dr. Gerald Crane. He's experimenting with fear toxin. And unsurprisingly, since this is Gotham, he's stopped and immediately killed by the police. But before he dies, he managed to inject his son, Jonathan Crane, with a kind of a super fear toxin that kind of drives him crazy. Later, there's a murder at Haley's Circus. While investigating, we meet John Grayson and Mary Lloyd, a couple of trapeze artists. And you're like, oh, it's the Graysons. That's interesting that they're bringing them in, but we never see them again. Instead, we need to focus on the actual murder. A woman named Lila Valeska is killed. Turns out she was killed by her son, a crazy young man named Jerome Valeska. He's arrested within the episode. And you might be thinking, I've never heard of this character. He's certainly no Scarecrow's dad. Why are we even talking about him? Well, just wait on that. And while we're catching up on stuff, let's check in with some of our other characters as well. Edward Nigma has been working at the GCPD, helping out solve the cases. He kind of gets weirder and weirder as the season goes on. His main story is he has a crush on a co-worker named Kristen Kringle. 
And I know what you're thinking. Her name is Kristen Kringle. That must be from the comics. Well, as far as I can tell, she isn't. Her name just happens to be Kristen Kringle. Anyway, Ed's in love with her. And he's going progressively crazy. As far as I remember, there's no particular reason for this. It just happens as the season goes on. Eventually, he develops a split personality that's essentially just evil. Ed finds out that the cop that Kringle is dating is abusing her. He tries to confront him and run him out of town, but he accidentally ends up just killing him. With his forensic knowledge, he's able to cover up the crime reasonably well. And with the cop out of the way, he ends up dating Kristen Kringle. So things actually go pretty well for her in the season one. Bruce Wayne and Alfred have been kind of just bumping around for the whole season. Really, Bruce has been looking into like possible corruption at Wayne Enterprises that might be linked to his parents' murder. He doesn't really find anything, but he does meet Lucius Fox. They do think that Thomas Wayne might have had some kind of double life. Selena has been hanging around town with Ivy Pepper. Who's Ivy Pepper, you might be asking? Well, remember at the beginning there was Mario Pepper who was framed for the Wayne's murder? He had a daughter, whose name was Ivy, who is now homeless and you know, just living on the street. Now, rewind a little bit to before the show started. There was some character images revealed, and one of them was of Ivy Pepper that heavily implied that she was meant to be Poison Ivy. Now, it seems odd to me that they would make a character who is so, like, inherently sexy a kid in this version of the show, but that's what they did. Anyway, unfortunately, she doesn't do very much in season one, so she's just kind of around. A quick note on Butch Gilzine. Remember, he was the other guy who worked for Falcone, and I said that he was important. He was working directly under Fish Mooney, but now that Fish is gone, he's just sort of in the wind. He's captured by Falcone and brainwashed by Victor Zaz. Because apparently that's another skill set that he has. He's conditioned by Zaz to take orders from Penguin, and he's given to Penguin as a, a gift, as a present for Penguin's role in helping Falcone succeed. And how about Barbara? After getting dumped a few times, Barbara left town, but then came back and immediately started dating a serial killer. There's a multi-episode arc where Gordon is trying to catch this serial killer called the Ogre. The Ogre ends up dating Barbara and they get along a lot better than you might think. But things eventually get out of hand. The Ogre and Barbara end up going to see Barbara's parents and her parents end up getting killed. The police arrive in time to save Barbara before she herself is killed by the ogre. Also, they kill the ogre. However, just jumping to the end of the season here, it turns out that Barbara has always been kind of crazy and resented her parents for whatever reason. She was the one who killed her parents during the whole thing. We just didn't see it the first time around. She reveals this to Lee, who volunteered to do some counseling with her after the whole ordeal. Apparently, Dr. Tompkins' medical license is just in general purpose. Barbara attacks Lee after this revelation, but Lee's able to fight her off, and uh, Barbara ends up getting arrested for the murders. And, most importantly, Fish Mooney. So remember Mooney fled out into the open sea like a pirate or something, and was immediately captured by mercenaries. As it turns out, the doll maker, who was mentioned way back at the beginning of the season, has apparently been based on some sort of island out in the ocean, and has been kidnapping people to harvest organs. The goons that picked up fish brought her to this prison island. Mooney spent some time politicking her way around the prison to get close to Dollmaker. And the Dollmaker in this iteration is named Francis Dollmacher, which may take the award for most on the nose supervillain real name. At least it's right up there with Otto Octavius. There's a fun scene where Dollmaker and Mooney come face to face. Dollmaker expresses in interest in harvesting Mooney's eyes to sell, so in an act of defiance, she digs out her own eyeball with a spoon. See? Weird show. Dollmaker is, I guess, moved by this act of defiance, and he A, gives Mooney a new eyeball, and B, entertains the idea of making her his second-in-command. And if you thought it was weird that they have the technology to just replace a whole eyeball, just you wait. 
Anyway, Fish doesn't have any intention of following through on this. She uses the opportunity to steal a boat and leaves the island as soon as possible to head back to Gotham. So this brings us to the season finale. Uh, Moroni and Falcone are at open war. Uh, the mayor and the police commissioner Loeb had been on Falcone's side, but now they're turning to Moroni's side because it seems like he's going to win the conflict. And since Gordon is so closely tied to Falcone, it seems like his career at the GCPD is running out quickly. So first, Fish Mooney returns to Gotham. The literal first person that she runs into when getting off the boat is Selina. So because of that, Selina's recruited to work with her on her side. The war is kind of winding down and Falcone is marked for death by Moroni. The Penguin reveals that his intention was always to start up this war between the two sides and then take advantage of the chaos to rise to become the boss of crime in Gotham. You know, chaos is a ladder. Gordon decides apparently that the crime boss that you know is better than the crime boss that you don't know. And so he believes that Falcone winning the war will be better for Gotham in the long run. So he saves Falcone from being killed by the Penguin. Gordon and Falcone and some friends are all together at Falcone's safe house, you know, trying to shelter when Fish Mooney shows up. Fish ends up cutting a deal with Maroney to kill Gordon, Falcone, and Penguin and then Moroni and Fish will divide up the city amongst themselves. And it seems like this plan will work too, except when Moroni shows up for the execution, he decides to give a little speech and he makes one too many sexist comments directed towards Fish. And so Fish gets mad and shoots him and kills him. We're cool, relax. I'm relaxed. I don't think you are, babes. Please don't call me babes. Babes? Really? It's a term of endearment. Simple math. One, two, babes. Oops. Sorry. It's the last time. We will whip this town like a rented mule. Right, babes? Oh, no, relax. I'm kidding you. Don't call her babes or toots or what have you. It's a woman's lip thing. Like seriously, that wasn't like a planned double cross on Mooney's part. There's dialogue where she says, well, I didn't plan for that to happen, but um, who knows, maybe this will be better now. Anyway, this unexpected turn of events, there was the execution party into chaos. The cops and Falcone are able to escape to safety. Uh, Penguin and Bush and Fish end up on the roof of the building of, of the safe house fish and penguin fighting it out. Butch really wants to help out fish, but he can't overcome the brainwashing um, that he has to follow penguin's commands. And penguin ends up throwing fish off the roof into the harbor and killing her. Later, we learn that Falcone is going to retire from crime. So with Mooney dead and Moroni dead, this leaves Penguin as the top guy in Gotham crime, just as he had hoped, apparently, from the very beginning. And our last bit before the season ends is Bruce Wayne tearing apart Wayne Manor looking for his father's secret. Eventually, he figures out the correct book to look in in, the Wayne's, in Thomas Wayne's library, and he finds an entrance to a secret passage in Wayne Manor. Where this goes? we don't see. It's very much the season one finale of Lost where they open the hatch and we just see that it goes down into a hole. So since this is early 2010s TV, we have a big mystery that is going to carry us into the next season. So that's season one of Gotham. I'd say we're off to a weird start. So much of it is taken up with the mob stuff. We have a few familiar names and super villainy type stuff going on in the background, but it's mostly about jockeying for power in the crime world. 
So right now, the show is really just kind of an extra spicy cops and robbers type thing. But things are about to change. Season 2. When the show was first airing, I noted that the creators of the show must have just said F it when they got to season 2. And I'm all for this. Do you remember the first season of Parks and Recreation? You might not because it's short and not good. If you go back and watch those episodes, they're not great, but obviously the show creators saw what they had, they made some adjustments, and the show went on to become an all-time classic. I have to imagine that the creators at Gotham thought to themselves, we got a whole season of television off this Gotham premise. Let's just go for it now and see what we can get away with. And go for it, they do. So to wrap up our cliffhanger from last season, Bruce and Alfred find this secret passage in Wayne Manor. And your first thought is Batcave. And I'm sure purposefully what you might think is like, oh, what if Thomas Wayne was a secret vigilante in this version of the story? What if Thomas Wayne was secretly a Batman and he was operating as super secret? So he was like the urban myth version of Batman. What if that's what inspires Bruce to take up the mantle of the bat? They don't do that here. Bruce and Alfred go into the secret passage and they find a locked door which I have to give Thomas Wayne some credit here because if you're going to build a secret room and you have the resources, why only hide it behind one secret entrance? So to fast forward the storyline because it takes a few episodes to go down. So Bruce and Alfred end up blowing up the locked door to get in it and they end up finding a secret room with a computer in it. So before Bruce can go into hacker mode and unlock the computer and see what's on it, Alfred realizes the danger of a child finding his father's secret computer that was hidden behind a locked door in a secret passage, and he smashes the computer to bits. He states that even though he has no idea what secrets Thomas Wayne could have been hiding, they probably shouldn't go looking for them. I'd say there's an equal chance that Alfred was afraid this was Thomas's computer full of his tax documents. Bruce gets really angry by this, and he fires Alfred for the first but not the last time in the show. And eventually he gets Lucius Fox to do data recovery on the computer and help to unlock it. So to catch up with our other friends, uh, Jim Gordon is still on the police force despite his explicit knowledge that Commissioner Loeb and Mayor James were both aligned with the mob. However, he's been demoted to a traffic cop. A Bullock actually retired from the police force and he is engaged in running a bar now. Penguin is in charge of crime in the city and Ed Nigma and Leslie are both still working for the GCPD. And Barbara's in Arkham Asylum. We get going right away as a new character, Tabitha Gallivan, breaks into Arkham and breaks out Barbara, Jerome Valeska, and Richard Sionis with the intent of forming a supervillain super team. Oh yeah, back in season one, they introduced Richard Sionis, who is presumably a relative of Roman Sionis, who will become Black Mask in the future. He actually doesn't want to be on the supervillain team, so they promptly kill him so they can go supervillain around. The corrupt Commissioner Loeb is run out of town for some reason, and the police chief from season one, Sarah Essen, is made the new police commissioner. Since she always liked Gordon, she reinstates him as a detective in the GCPD, so it seems like they'll be on a lot better footing now. Unfortunately, Essen is immediately killed by the group of supervillains who are now calling themselves the Maniacs attack the GCPD. They kill a bunch of cops, including the commissioner, on live TV and publicly announce their plans to terrorize the city. Remember when I talked about this show straddling the line between Goofy and Grizzly? A good example of this is when they announce the name Maniacs to the world by spelling out the word Maniacs in the bodies of dead police officers on the news. Now that the GCPD doesn't have a police chief, uh, Nathaniel Barnes is brought in to be the new chief. I'm oh, sick and tired of your holier-than-thou crap, Gordon. Yeah, then do some police work. Last arrest you made was your bookie. My name is Nathaniel Barnes. Captain Nathaniel Barnes. That's right. I'm your new boss. And who is behind the maniacs? We don't even need to wait to find out because it's immediately revealed that it's another new character named Theo Gallivan. Theo Gallivan. 
publicly, Theo Galavan has burst onto the scene in Gotham and wants to help out the town through charity and philanthropy. But behind closed doors and directly to us, the audience, he has a big supervillain plan ready to go. He's even nice enough to lay out his nefarious origin story right for us, so we don't even need to wonder about all that. It seems his real last name is Dumas, and he is, comes from one of the founding families of Gotham. For reasons, uh, they were exiled long ago, and now Theo and his sister Tabitha have come back to Gotham to get their revenge and take their rightful place. Nice and simple. This is such a breath of fresh air compared to the mob shenanigans from last season. So here's the plan. Galavan sends the Maniacs to a high society charity auction that for some reason is being aired on live TV. I guess that's the kind of thing that's popular in Gotham. Maybe they don't have a sports team right now. Barbara and Jerome specifically are starting to kill off the socialites at the party. They find Bruce, of course, who is there, and they plan to kill him next. And I'm sure the police were involved in this somehow, but I don't remember. But specifically, it's Theo Gallivan himself who saves Bruce and kills Jerome on TV, so he looks like a giant hero to the whole city. Now, a quick aside. This is a Batman thing, right? So when you think of Batman, who follows closely thereafter? The Joker, right? So you might be wondering, are they going to do the Joker in this show? We have Penguin and Riddler in their early forms. They mentioned Scarecrow. Would they go with the Joker? Prior to the show's release, the creators actually addressed this in a weird way. The showrunner, Bruno Heller, stated that they would introduce a proto-Joker somewhere down the line, and then implied and later officially stated that there would be multiple possibilities of who might end up being the Joker eventually. Some reports, and even some I remember reading at the time, sort of took this to mean that there would be a possible Joker showing up in every episode. The pilot of the show even had a stand-up comedian in it that was obviously supposed to be a reference to this. I'm not afraid of death so much as I am of dying. I, um, I want to die how my father died, peacefully in his sleep, not like his screaming, terrified passengers. <laughs> now, if you watch any four episodes of season one, you'll see that that's definitely not true. That's not what they ended up doing. However, they did introduce the Red Hood gang as well in season one, so you can see kind of what they were planning on. So they definitely did intentionally plant a lot of Joker seeds. And the biggest seed of all seems to have been Jerome Valeska. Now, if it wasn't obvious back in season one when he was the circus performer turned crazy killer, now when they brought back Jerome Valeska in season two, he was acting even more, let's just say, clownish. Thank God, I've been trying to- Sorry, Jimbo, it's just little old me. Drum, are you outside? <gasps> you are, aren't you? <laughs> oh, goody. Don't want people to die. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I think that went well. Hang on to your hats, folks, because you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Very theatric, to say the least. And it seemed obvious that, like, oh, this guy is Joker. Then, killing him off was a bit of a surprise. You'd expect this guy to stick around for a while. But they went ahead and it took a little bit of extra step in that pre-Joker direction. When he dies, remember this is on live TV, the show cuts to a bunch of people who are watching this on TV who are clearly enthralled by what Jerome is doing. The implication being that the Joker, whoever will become the Joker in the future, was watching this and was inspired by this to kind of take on that persona. It's a nice little setup that they could always come back to later if they wanted to. Spoilers, they never come back to this. So back to Galavan's plan, it's actually a pretty good plan. You know, he's now seen by, a, by the city and by Bruce as well as a hero for stopping Jerome. Also, he's kidnapped the mayor, Aubrey James, 
and so he has put out some misinformation that the mayor just left town. In the preceding weeks, the deputy mayor had taken over the city, but then the deputy mayor was killed at that charity auction. Now there's going to be a special election held to elect a new mayor. And since he's seen so favorably by the public, he's primed you know, to kind of take office, and he in fact does run for mayor. Also, he has a young Silver St. Cloud cozying up to Bruce Wayne at his school as a way to manipulate Bruce, because the Waynes were one of those founding families as well that he wants to get revenge on. And also, also, to take over crime in the city, Galavan has the Penguin's mom kidnapped. It's been established before that Penguin is really close to his mom, it's kind of his only family, so he has her kidnapped so he can get leverage on Penguin. And the plan works out because Galavan is elected to be mayor, so things are going pretty well for him. Briefly, I need to mention as part of the Galavan penguin conflict. There's a family of arsonists who are hired to do some jobs. They're called the Pikes. Uh, most of them are killed because this is Gotham after all. But one sister, Bridget Pike, is believed to be dead uh, but is severely burned, however survives, and is transferred to a mysterious facility called Indian Hill. More on that in a bit. Penguin tries a plan to save his mom and get out from under Galavan's control. So as part of this plan, he's going to send Butch to infiltrate Galavan's group uh, to kind of sell the idea that Butch and Penguin had a kind of a falling out and he's Galavan can trust him. Before he sends him out to do this, he legitimately cuts off Butch's hand, you know, to really sell it. Galavan's a smart guy. <laughs> He'll buy it if we sell it right. How? Oh. Now the plan goes badly because Galavan immediately sees through this ruse and he has Butch get beaten until the brainwashing doesn't work anymore and he doesn't have to listen to Penguin anymore. I guess if the brainwashing was caused by torture, then it can be undone by torture. It's the Gilligan's Island idea where, like, if one blow to the head gives you amnesia, then a subsequent blow to the head will cure it. If there's any doctors watching, like, please let us know in the comments how accurate that is. So Penguin thinks that he is going to, to save his mom, but it's a trap slash a trick meant to just lure Penguin out of hiding. And uh, Tabitha kills Penguin's mom right in front of him. They plan to kill Penguin too, and they, I think they shoot him at least once, but he managed to escape off into the woods where this meeting was being held. It looks like he's going to die out in the woods, but he's saved by Edward Nigma. So we need to catch up on what's been happening with Nigma. Remember, he had a crush on his coworker, Kristen Kringle, and she had an abusive cop boyfriend, and Nigma's alternate personality ended up killing him. Well, he actually starts dating Kristen Kringle in this season. And things start out going pretty well. There's an episode where uh, they have a date with um, Gordon and Leslie. Like, they're also dating as well, I should mention. So it was going pretty well until Ed accidentally kills her. I believe she starts to figure out something about her previous boyfriend's disappearance and slash death, and that Ed had something to do with it and he tries to stop her from talking about it, and he actually accidentally ends up smothering her to death. Because of this, Ed's alternate evil personality rears its ugly head again. Um, it even hides Kristen's body and forces Ed to like, solve riddles to find the body. When he does find the body, he's in the middle of burying it out in the woods where he buried the cop's body as well. When the penguin comes running out of there, like wounded from his encounter with the Galavans, and that's where they run into each other. Nema kind of takes him in to help him recover, you know, you know, just being a good Samaritan. So Butch was really affected by the whole thing with the penguin and the double crossing and the killing of his mom, and probably also affected by the anti-conditioning conditioning that he went through. So he tips off Gordon that Galavan is really behind all the crime in the city. Remember, there are, there are police on this show. 
around the same time, Barbara ends up kidnapping Gordon and Lee and like plans to kill them in a big wedding themed production. I remember she was with the Galavans for a minute, so she actually ends up spilling some information about where the mayor, Aubrey James, is being held. Um, so Gordon's able to get that information out of her. She ends up falling out of a window, but she survives and she's sent back to Arkham. So Gordon ends up rescuing Aubrey James, who is shockingly still alive at this point. You know, after Galavan spread the rumors that he left town and now he was elected mayor, you'd think he would have just killed him because he's a liability to be left alive, but he didn't for whatever reason, so good. Um, and with that, the testimony that Aubrey James can offer, they arrest Galavan for being behind you know, the kidnapping of the previous mayor. Galavan goes to trial almost immediately somehow, but when they call Aubrey James to the stand, he recants his previous testimony and says, no, it wasn't Galavan who kidnapped me, it was Penguin. Obviously somebody got to Aubrey James and got him to change the statement. Gordon is pretty mad about this because this gets Galavan right off the hook. And he's so mad, in fact, that he assaults Galavan at the courthouse on live TV. Again, who is the mayor of Gotham at this point? This seems like a good opportunity for Galavan's guys to just kill Gordon, but he's saved by Nigma and Penguin, who show up and like take him to safety. They've been together since they met in the forest while Penguin's been recovering. And remember, uh, Nigma is still like working for the GCPD, and he has like a decent relationship with Jim at this point, so he goes with them and to kind of hide and regroup since Jim is wanted by the police now. Around this time, Galavan's family shows up, the Order of St. Dumas. They're the ones who were kicked out of Gotham generations ago and they have the crazy religious bent on taking over the city again. And obviously they're using Theo Galavan to do it. They're also, now that they're in town, they are kidnapping and sacrificing people for religious reasons. Now back to Bruce Wayne, as part of Theo and Silver's manipulations of Bruce, they've sort of floated him the idea that they know who killed his parents, that the Order does. But by this point, Bruce sort of knows that they're evil. So him and Selina sort of team up to con Silver St. Cloud and they get her to reveal the name that they know who might be responsible for the Wayne's murder, and that's M. Malone. That's all they get, but it's something to go on. Uh, the Order of St. Dumas is pretty upset about getting played by Bruce, and so they decide they're just going to kidnap him and sacrifice him in one of their rituals. So while Gordon is on the run with Penguin and Riddler, he finds out that Leslie is pregnant. Uh, so uh, they decide that things have gotten way too weird in Gotham with the, you know, religious sect that's secretly running the government, and they decide they should probably move away presumably to a place where Jim won't be arrested for assaulting the mayor on live TV. But it's about this time that Alfred and Selina track him down and they say, hey, Bruce Wayne has been kidnapped, can you help? So he says, okay, we won't move just yet, we won't leave town just yet, we'll go help out Bruce Wayne. Nigma and Penguin also just want to kill Galavan, so they team up together as well. They all get together and storm the Order's stronghold and they're able to rescue Bruce. Tabitha and Silver decides things have gone way too sideways with the cult, and they decide to just ditch Theo. Like seriously, they like parachute off the top of a building and, and fly away. Theo Galavan is left to Gordon and Penguin, and they literally just kill him. So the threat of Galavan is over. But before we end this part of the season, we see that Galavan's body is taken to the aforementioned Indian Hill. It seems that this is some kind of secret lab that's connected to Arkham Asylum. It was mentioned when Bruce was digging around the Wayne Enterprises information looking for the big secret. It's also revealed that the Indian Hill folks have the preserved bodies of Jerome Valeska and Fish Mooney. So some weird stuff is going on around there. So we're in the second half of season two. I mentioned before, starting in season two, the marketing started giving subtitles to each half of the season. Since these were usually 20 plus episode seasons, this broke them down to like 10-ish episode chunks, make things a little bit more manageable. Also, narratively, this tightened things up a little bit as there were like contained arcs, maybe about two a season. Again, I retroactively am calling season one mob shenanigans. 
Uh, but the official, unofficial subtitle for the first half of season two was Rise of the Villains. Which seems kind of like an obvious pitch to the audience, like, hey, you know all those Batman villains you like? We're going to put them in the show now. So that leads into season 2.5, which is subtitled Wrath of the Villains. So Gordon is reinstated to the GCPD again. Um, it seems that after all the business with Galvan, now that he's dead, the, the previous mayor, Aubrey James, is able to change his story again and affirms that it was Galavan that kidnapped him, so Gordon is off the hook for all the stuff. Also, at some point along the way, Gordon was able to convince Bullock to come back to the GCPD. So the whole thing with the bar that he had and his fiance that just sort of goes away. So he's back on the force now. Penguin gets arrested, I think specifically for murdering Galavan, but maybe just crime in general. And so he's sent to Arkham. In Penguin's absence, Butch takes over the running the crime in Gotham, and pretty quickly Tabitha Gallivan comes back and proposes an alliance with Butch, and they start a romantic relationship as well. Now, keeping with our villain promise, Victor Freeze shows up on the scene. His name is Victor Fries. He's abducting people off the streets and doing ice experiments to find a treatment slash cure for his wife Nora's illness. You know, pretty standard Mr. Freeze stuff. The cops intervene and Nora, who was previously unaware of Victor's murders to try and save her, instead of perpetuating this, she decides to kill herself with one of Victor's uh, unsuccessful treatments rather than have this go on. Victor is so distraught by this that he tries to kill himself as well. Again, he's thought to be dead, but he doesn't actually die and he's taken to Indian Hill as well. Here at Indian Hill, Freeze is revived, and we officially meet Dr. Hugo Strange, played wonderfully by B.D. Wong. He's running the Indian Hill facility we've heard so much about, and he's doing all kinds of mad science-y experiments on people. Strange revived Freeze, but he now has his signature condition where he can't survive outside of the Sub-Zero environment. Penguin also met with Strange when he was in Arkham, but because he's evil, he decided to just let Penguin go or help him escape or something, but he lets him out. Also, he r releases Barbara from Arkham, and Barbara goes to work for Butch and Tabitha. Speaking of Penguin, he decides to take a break from the main story and go off and do a side quest. While visiting his mother's grave, Penguin runs into his father, who is played by Paul Rubens, which is a wonderfully fun bit of casting because Paul Rubens played the Penguin's father in a cameo at the beginning of Batman Returns. Fun. So it turns out Penguin's dad is a wealthy Gothamite. Um, he had a relationship with Penguin's mom um, when they were young. It was frowned upon by the family, so she was sort of kicked out, and he never knew that he had a son uh, with her. They actually get along really well, and uh, Penguin's dad invites him to be part of his family. He has a wife and other children as well. It turns out Oswald has sort of stumbled into like a fairy tale type of situation where his dad's whole family seems to hate him and they just want his inheritance. Dad mentions his intentions to add Oswald to his will as well, to like make him a, like a fully part of the family. Um, but unfortunately, he dies under mysterious circumstances before this can happen. It turns out that the family had actually been poisoning him to hasten his demise. And now Penguin sort of ends up in a Cinderella situation where he's like working for his step family who all hate him. So Penguin uses this opportunity to uncover the murder plot and he resolves this by poisoning his step-siblings with the same poison that they used to kill his dad, cooking them into a dish, and then feeding them to their mother before he kills her also. Remember that goofy, grisly line I mentioned before? So this leaves Penguin in control of his dad's wealth, probably unofficially. Now for Bruce Wayne's side quest, which is about the M. Malone tip that he got earlier in the season. If you know your lore, you might have recognized that name already, and it does in fact turns out to be a guy named Matches Malone. Bruce tracks him down, and it turns out he's a hitman who was hired by someone to kill the Waynes. He doesn't know who the client was, but he does admit to the murders. 
Bruce thinks about killing him, but ultimately decides against it. However, Matches himself is apparently bothered enough by the whole thing to decide to kill himself instead. Maybe he was afraid of the client seeking revenge on him. I don't remember. Again, if you know your lore, you might be thinking, wait, it's traditionally Joe Chill who kills the Waynes. This must be some kind of red herring. It's not. It's just him. Matches Malone is the guy who did it. But there is the issue of the unknown client. Bruce decides that since the trail has gone cold at this point, he's going to step away from his riches and go live on the street with Selena to maybe try and find a lead there, I guess. Now back to our rise slash wrath of the villains side of things. Remember Edward Nigma has murdered a couple people and just gotten away with it? Well, people have started to notice that uh, Kristen Kringle has disappeared and Gordon decides to look into it. Ed goes on the defensive on this and his alternate personality sort of takes over at this point. He just sort of becomes the Riddler. And in an episode that outpaces maybe any other live action appearance of the Riddler in its sheer Riddlerness, Nigma manipulates Jim all over the city and ends up framing him for Kristen and her ex's murders to the point where he is arrested and sent to jail for months. So Gordon is out of the GCPD again. Jim is so distraught that he asks Leslie to break up with him and leave town and move on. She ends up doing this and leaves town. We also find out later that she ends up losing her pregnancy as well. So things have all of a sudden taken a very bad turn for Jim Gordon. After a few months, Bullock asks Carmine Falcone for help with Gordon being in prison. Because even though he's retired and a criminal, they're still on good terms. They come up with a plan where they fake Gordon's death to allow him to escape from prison without anyone being the wiser. Gordon knows it was Nigma who ended up framing him for the murders, so he's able to work in secret to strike back. They trick Ed into trying to move the bodies, and so then they follow him and they find the bodies and the police are there, so they arrest him, sending him to jail and clearing Gordon's name. Of course, this gets Jim back on to the force again. So this sends up our pieces for the end of the season. Lucius Fox finally fixed up Thomas Wayne's computer, and they find out that the big secret on it isn't tax documents. It's actually about Indian Hill. It seems that Thomas Wayne had discovered that it was part of the Arkham Asylum plans, and he had tried to get it shut down. And it seems that Hugo Strange may have been involved in the plot to kill him. Back at Indian Hill slash Arkham, now that Riddler has arrived there. Um, Hugo Strange brings him in to work on his projects. And in his most mad science-y project yet, he manages to resurrect Theo Gallivan, brings him back to life. So he's just alive again. <sighs> well, um... I guess we take him off the board. However, Gallivan's alive, but he's completely out of his mind and, like, practically incoherent. Riddler recommends Strange come up with a story to help Gallivan's mind, like, build a framework which it can function. And Strange decides to pick a story from the Order of St. Dumas, and he convinces Galavan that he is sort of this avenging hero from the mythology called Azrael. And he sends Galavan out on a mission to take out his enemies. For those of you who are in the know and were wondering if they're going to do Azrael with all of the Order of St. Dumas stuff, I bet you weren't expecting it to come in this form, were you? So Azrael now is running amok in Gotham trying to kill Jim Gordon. And he's doing it very out in the open so that everybody is like, hey, that's the former mayor who was definitely dead and is alive again and like killing people. Tabitha tries to reason with her newly resurrected brother, but he doesn't really remember her at all, so he just ends up stabbing her. She survives, but this gets Butch really angry at Azrael and by sense and strange, so he's gonna go after him. And Penguin decides to team up with Butch to go after Azrael as well because he figures he's 
probably on the revenge list for killing Galvan in the first place. Azrael next goes for Wayne Manor because Bruce Wayne is also on the revenge list. Uh, the cops try to intervene, but the Penguin's the one who takes care of things because if you want to make sure that the guy you already killed doesn't come back again, you have to kill him extra hard. Penguin blows up Azrael with a rocket launcher. You're welcome. So I guess, um, let's just, uh, I guess we can just put him back where he was. So I had a, maybe a times two there. So now that the word is out about Hugo Strange and Andy Hill, pretty much everybody's coming to take him out. And we also find out that Hugo Strange has been working for a mysterious group called The Court. Yes, it's that, The Court. Now that he's cracked the code, apparently he's been churning out resurrections and also giving people superpowers. We saw that he, he saved Mr. Freeze before and gave him his powers. We learned that he also was able to save Bridget Pike and gave her like a you know, fire suit. And so she's full on Firefly now. Here we also see Basil Carlo, who's given his Clayface powers and he impersonates Gordon for a little bit. And we also see that he's brought Fish Mooney back to life. We're just gonna keep the eraser handy going forward. She also has powers now and is able to mind control people by, by touching them. So all the good guys plan to attack Indian Hill. Strange is planning to get everybody inside and then blow the whole facility up so he can kill everybody and cover his tracks as well. And everything goes wrong. Nobody's plan really works out. Riddler, Bruce, and Lucius end up learning a bit about the court and that they're a thing that's out there. But everybody escapes the facility, including all of the patients with powers, um, Riddler, Mooney, Strange as well, but the place does blow up, so it's been taken care of. So now there's just unknown numbers of superpower people roaming the streets of Gotham. However, since Gordon has solved the immediate issue, he decides to leave and go find Lee. So now since Bruce has this lead on the court who seem to be responsible for the death of his parents, he's decided to focus on tracking them down. Also, uh, one of the patients who escaped from Indian Hill when it all blew up is apparently a clone of Bruce Wayne. And that closes out season two. Now, as you can see, they really started going for it in the wacky super villainy type stuff. And luckily for all of us, they don't let up here. Season three, part one, Mad City. We pick up a little bit later for season three. Uh, we find out that Gordon did track down Lee and he discovered that she was with another man at that point. Um, instead of actually talking to her, he decided to just leave at that point and just went back to Gotham. Apparently Lee doesn't have like social media or anything, could have saved Jim a trip. Now he didn't go back to the GCPD this time. And instead he's working independently as a bounty hunter to kind of track down all those superpower people who escape from Indian Hill. Uh, he's also decided to move on from Lee as well, as he is dating someone else too. He's dating Valerie Vale, who presumably is like the mother or aunt or other relation to Vicky Vale, which is a fun little reference. Again, there are these super powered folks running all over the city and Fish Mooney is sort of heading up a gang of them. She's back to her old crimey ways, uh, but this time she's specifically looking for Hugo Strange again. Remember, she has powers where she can make you do whatever she wants if she touches you. Uh, however, these powers seem to be bad for her and they seem to be killing her. So it looks like she's looking for Hugo Strange to cure her so she won't die again. Penguin and Butch are still working together after teaming up last season. And also now Tabitha and Barbara have coupled up and they're running a nightclub together. Real quick, there's a nightclub that has been in the show since literally episode one, Fish ran it back then. And so it's just getting like passed around from one person to the next. If you were thinking about it, you might have correctly guessed that this is the Iceberg Lounge, the club that the Penguin runs in a lot of Batman lore. Uh, you are correct, it is the Iceberg Lounge, but it will pass by just about every villain in the show before it's all said and done. The restraint in not calling it the hot potato at some point is admirable. And I'd say like the hot potato club is not a terrible name. 
Oh, and Bruce is still trying to track down the court uh, from last season, and per usual, it takes a long time before there's any progress on this front. To wrap up the immediate end of last season, they everybody finds out that Hugo Strange is holed up in this old house somewhere, and so all of our main characters bolt to try and be the first person to capture him. Some are going to get him directly, some are going to catch fish because they know fish is going to get him, but they all go after Strange. And as it goes, Fish kind of gets her way. Kind of. Uh, she's able to grab Strange, and they both take off, uh, presumably so he can um, help give her some kind of cure, but really it's just a way to get them both out of the story for the time being. Um, all of Fish's super-powered goons are sort of left to their own devices in the city. Speaking of which, a little detail I need to plant right now. You remember Ivy Pepper? Remember the kid who was teased to be Poison Ivy way back at the start of the show and has been sort of around the whole time? Well, she pops up again. When uh, Fish's goons are sort of roaming around town looking for Hugo Strange, they happen to run into Ivy. So now, one of Fish's goons, his superpower is he can age you and kill you like, like Donovan in Last Crusade. <laughs> like age you to death in a moment. So Ivy runs afoul of this guy. And the important part about this is he tries to like put the whammy on her and presumably murder a child. Um, and he's able to make contact with her, touch her to use his powers, but he isn't able to actually kill her, but he definitely made the contact, but she like ends up falling into a sewer pipe and gets like washed away to who knows where. This might seem completely random at this point, but it's good to just get that little bit out of the way right now. Now, with the Hugo Strange stuff out of the way, we can get to our main thrust. Jervis Tetch has come to town. He has the ability to hypnotize people, like really hypnotize people. Like, not quite on the level of what Fish Mooney was doing, where she could touch you and, you know, compel you to do whatever, but, you know, still pretty good. He could he uses the watch and he hypnotizes. He doesn't seem to have any special powers. He's just really good at hypnosis. He's looking for his sister, Alice. And he actually goes right to Gordon to ask for his help in finding her. He claims that Alice has some kind of illness and she went to Hugo Strange for treatment in that. And he hasn't been able to find her since. But now that Strange has been deposed, that she might be out there somewhere. You know, which is a pretty reasonable assessment and going to Gordon for help seems pretty reasonable. Except that when we, as the audience, first met Jervis, he hypnotized someone and got them to steal something or murder somebody or something, so we know he's up to some no goodness. Gordon does manage to track down Alice, and it seems that Jervis was lying a bit. She was at Indian Hill, but she's been running away from Jervis ever since. Apparently, Jervis had previously kept her in prison himself, and he has an unhealthy obsession with her. Also, the illness that she had is a result of a strange virus in her blood. After further tampering from Hugo Strange at Indian Hill, it seems that anybody who gets exposed to the virus um, goes crazy with rage and also like gets a little bit of superpowers too. After finding Alice, uh, Gordon takes her into protective custody at the GCPD, but since the GCPD is one of the least safe places in the city, um, it's immediately attacked by Jervis and some hypnotized henchmen, and he's able to abduct her. It seems that Jervis wants Alice so he can use her blood to make more superpowered people. I don't remember exactly why he wants to do this, but I guess that's the idea. The police try to rescue Alice, but during the attempt, um, unfortunately, Alice ends up falling off of something in the warehouse, and there's some beams or superstructure that's just in the middle of the room and she ends up getting impaled and sadly dies. Now she is sadly dead, but that does seem to solve the problem of her tainted blood and the virus. Now, the reason I mention these sort of grisly details of her specific death is because the chief, Nathaniel Barnes, comes to check out the scene. Alice is up in the air, impaled on this structure and Barnes looks up at it and very unluckily a drop of her blood falls down and lands directly into his eyeball. And based on everything we've known, we've known this is probably a bad thing. And now just to backtrack a bit, uh, while Jim has been dealing with all the Tetch family drama, Lee actually ended up moving back to Gotham again. 
um, she's engaged and her fiance happens to be Mario Falcone, son of Carmine Falcone. Despite the family connections, he seems to be an okay guy and he's taken a job as a doctor at the at a local hospital. Again, since Gordon is, you know, dating Valerie at this point, you know, he seems to have moved on and is generally okay with this. But then things get messy because of Tetch. Jervis wants revenge on Gordon for Alice's death, so he goes full Mad Hatter. He kidnaps Lee and Valerie and starts messing with Jim and everything culminates in, of course, a tea party. Now, forgive me for a moment while I gush about this scene because it's one of my favorites and it stands out in the show. Jim finds out where Lee and Valerie are being held and that Jervis is invited to this tea party. He doesn't tell the police for whatever reason, maybe Jervis said that he couldn't, uh, but he does manage to get a hold of Mario, Lee's fiance. And so they come up with a plan because Lee and Valerie are being held in Mario's townhouse. The plan is for Gordon to walk into the tea party, into the trap, while Mario will come into the basement and uh, get a gun that he has stashed there and then ambush them to, to get the drop on Hatter. They begin the party and the plan is that Jervis is going to kill someone who Gordon loves in retaliation for Alice. And so he asks who he loves, Lee or Valerie. And Gordon manages to, I'm going to say, negotiate a bit to just kind of stall for time without answering the question. And this allows Mario to get the drop on him just like they planned. However, it turned out Hatter anticipated this. He'd searched the house ahead of time, he found the gun, and he replaced the clip uh, for the gun with an empty one. So the gun that Mario just ambushed him with is completely empty. And so the goons just simply take him away and that plan is cooked. So Gordon tries to save both of the girls by doing the like, you know, kill me and said, kill me for revenge, but Jervis isn't going for it. And so eventually he changes up the question. He says, just tell me who to kill. I'll kill them. Or if you don't tell me the count of three, I'll kill them both. Jim tries to come up with a solution for this, but he can't. So through some anguish, he says, kill Lee. And Hatter takes this as a sign that he really loves Valerie the most. So he shoots Valerie in the stomach. Luckily, Tetch is satisfied by this apparently. And so he just decides to leave. And uh, shockingly for this show, Valerie survives her gunshot. She's rushed to the hospital and she's, she survives and presumably makes a recovery. Uh, when Jim goes to see her next though, she has kind of done the math in her head that Jim probably told Hatter to kill Lee knowing that Valerie would get shot instead. And so she takes that as a sign that he still has feelings for Lee and decides to break up with him. We don't see Valerie again in this series, but I think that little turn of events of assessing a situation, realizing the relationship should end and just like getting out of there makes her maybe the smartest character in the show. So thanks for indulging me on that. I just, that's a standout episode for me. The way the show goes, you fully believe that something is going to come along to save Jim from having to make the choice. And you know, you still could build on that romantic tension that they have implanted there, but they just don't and they just go for it and it's, it's great. So back to the big picture, Gordon rejoins the GCPD again. Mad Hatter is moving on to a bigger plan. He manages to steal some of Alice's blood and his plan is to dose some of the members of the rich and powerful families of Gotham with it to give them the, what is called the Tetch virus. Um, he stopped by the police before he can do this, but specifically he stopped by Barnes, who is manifesting some of those virus tendencies and some super strength as well. So Mad Hatter is locked up, but now Barnes is starting to lose it. He's going out at night and he's just killing criminals as the executioner, which I couldn't track down if that's a specific reference to a DC villain, but it feels like it should be, but whatever. Um, Gordon catches on to this and he is able to kind of capture and send Barnes to Arkham. So we've got Hatter locked away, Barnes is locked up, the Tetch virus seems to be all squared away. Finally, the loose ends from Alice Tetch are taken care of. Except they aren't. We're getting close to Lee and Mario's wedding and there's an assassination attempt made on them. Um, they survive, but during the attempt, Mario is showing some symptoms 
of the Tetch virus, you know, with extra strength and, you know, kind of ragey. Mario does take a test to prove that he's healthy and he's, you know, cleared by Gordon to go ahead with the wedding, except they find out that he scammed the test and he does in fact have the Tetch virus. The wedding goes down and they leave on their honeymoon and Gordon takes off to find them and help save Lee. Uh, he goes to this cabin where they, Mario and Lee have presumably just arrived to begin their honeymoon. I'm going to try and describe what happens here because it's a super memorable scene, but not quite in the same way as the tea party one was. So Lee is standing out on a dock, looking out at like a lake or something. And Mario is coming out on the dock to join her. Except that we see he has a giant knife in his hand and he looks very menacing. But Lee isn't looking at him. So Gordon shows up and he sees this. He sees the whole scene with Lee and then Mario coming at her with a knife. He goes to stab her. Gordon sees this, pulls his gun, shoots Mario. Mario drops the knife into the lake. So the murder weapon, the would-be murder weapon disappears. And he just falls down and is dead. So from Lee's perspective, on her wedding day, her ex-boyfriend just showed up and murdered her husband for no reason at all. Of course, Lee is upset by this. Uh, for reasons that I don't remember, the police believe Jim's story that Mario was had the Tetch virus and he was killed him to save Lee, so he doesn't really get in trouble for this. Uh, Carmine Falcone puts out a hit on him, as you might imagine, uh, for killing his son. Um, he dodges Hitman for like an episode, but Lee asks Carmine to call it off because she doesn't actually want him to die, even though she's still suspicious about the whole situation. So that was quite a ride. And uh, before we wrap up this half of season three, we should check back in with our other friends as well. So the Penguin wants to be mayor. Uh, with all the chaos surrounding the super people running around and Mad Hatter doing his shenanigans, he uh, rallies support and mounts a campaign to be mayor. Because it wouldn't be a live action Batman project without the Penguin running for mayor at some point. And if you're thinking about it, just who knows how the election system works in Gotham at this point after all the craziness last season? Who knows? Uh, to help with this campaign, Penguin gets Nigma out of Arkham legally somehow to help with the campaign and it works through all kinds of dealing penguin does win the election and becomes the mayor of gotham and it might seem far-fetched that a known criminal and generally bad dude would win a popular election for an executive office but Anyway, Ed and Oswald get pretty close during this whole process. Butch starts to get jealous of Nigma kind of taking over as Penguin's right-hand man. Ed catches on to this and he manipulates Butch into publicly attacking Penguin. And then Ed saves Penguin from Butch's attack to further ingratiate himself. Butch is almost killed by this, but he survives. He's actually saved by Tabitha, since those two are so pretty close. Penguin is even more drawn to Ed by this point. He starts to realize that he has like romantic feelings for him. Meanwhile, Ed has a new girlfriend. During the campaign, Ed meets a woman named Isabella, who looks suspiciously like Kristen Kringle, the woman he was in love with, but accidentally killed in the last season. Like, they're played by the same actress, but there's no connection here, actually. Um, it's no resurrection, no alternate universe hijinks. It's just somebody else who happens to look exactly like somebody who we've already met. And it turns out she's a perfect fit for Nigma. She loves puzzles, too. She's really into Ed, and they start going out, and they seem great together. Penguin is really pissed by this because he has realized that he has feelings for Ed. So instead of just, like, talking things out, he decides to try and break up Ed and Isabella. First, he tells Isabella about Ed's past as a crazy murderer. You'd think this would be enough to break them up, but Isabella, while concerned at first, is able to look past this and embrace Ed for who he is. A crazy murderer. Like, seriously, there's a scene where she asks him about it, and he's like, oh yeah, I, I did kill those people, but I didn't mean to kill them. And she's like, okay, I understand. So relationship-wise, they're still okay. Penguin's plan B is to cut the brakes on Isabella's car. She runs into a train and dies. Enigma is heartbroken by this, but since he's the Riddler, 
he decides to investigate the crime scene himself and he discovers that there was foul play. I'd imply here that he's better at police work than the police are at this point, but you know, you have to remember they were dealing with the Mad Hatter and their chief going crazy, so we'll cut him a little bit of slack. Ed thinks that it was Butch who did this as revenge for his own plot that he just pulled off. So to get revenge, he kidnaps Butch and Tabitha and puts them into a Saw-style trap where the machine that he's locked them in will cut off Tabitha's hand unless she turns on Butch and kills him. Now Butch implores Tabitha to kill him to save herself, but she refuses and, you know, you know cares about Butch too much and, and refuses to do it. Now Ed sees this and he's actually moved by their love for each other and he's convinced that Butch didn't really do it and he tries to save them from his own trap. I say tries because his fail safe goes wrong and it malfunctions and cuts off tap of the sand anyway. Ed apologizes for the misunderstanding and suggests that they seek medical attention immediately. And at this point, Penguin does decide to confess his feelings to Ed. He does this and Ed pretends not to understand. Like they do like that. I love you. Oh, I love you too, buddy. But Ed really does understand. He kind of puts the pieces together and he realizes that Penguin was the one who must have killed Isabella. So he puts together a plan for revenge. Ed finds Clayface again from last season and gets him to impersonate Penguin's dead dad to kind of drive him a little nuts. Penguin ends up doing some interviews and um, ends up making a fool of himself in the media. So both the population of the city and the mob, they both start to lose faith in Oswald's leadership. Nigma also contacted Butch, Barbara, and Tabitha, who did successfully have her hand reattached, and they all worked together to bring Penguin down. This culminates in Ed taking Penguin out to the docks and admitting that he knows that it was him who killed Isabella, and he actually says that he is quite moved by Penguin's feelings for him, but ends up shooting him anyway and throwing him in the river to die. So if there's been a theme for the first half of this season so far, I would say that it's relationships are hard. Oh, and what's Bruce Wayne been up to this whole time? Well, remember there was that clone of Bruce that came out of the rubble at Indian Hill? Well, apparently the clone just went straight to Wayne Manor, and when he got there, Bruce and Alfred were like, whoa, a clone? That's crazy. Initially, they decided to help out the clone. He goes by the name Five. So they try to just help him out and bring him into the family, but eventually Five decides that he just can't deal and he leaves. The clone then goes to hang out with Selina, pretending he's the real Bruce, and he's trying to hang out with her and get closer to her, but eventually she figures out that he's a clone and she's mad about being lied to, so she sort of kicks him out too. So he takes off again, but he's immediately kidnapped by the court, and they kind of hold on to him for the time being. So we have one last bit for this half of the season, and it's kind of a doozy. It seems that someone has taken over Hugo Strange's bringing people back to life business. We meet a guy named Dwight Pollard, played by Warner Brothers and DC MVP Dave Dismalton. So remember last season when Jerome died on TV and we saw a bunch of people inspired by his jokery, yet legally distinct from the Joker style antics? So it seems that Dwight was one of these people and has formed a kind of a cult around Jerome. Now, Dwight has Jerome's body and plans to resurrect him. Again, they showed his body in Indian Hill last year, but I guess they didn't get around to bringing him back before the place blew up. And now Dwight has his body somehow. Dwight has had some success with the resurrections. Yeah, we're at that point in the show where you can say like, yeah, I'm pretty good at bringing people back to life. He tries it on Jerome, but fails. All of his cult friends really have their heart set on Jerome coming back to life. So he's not sure how to deal with this. He ends up figuring, oh, I told them Jerome would be the face of our movement. So I'll just take that very literally and I will cut the face off of Jerome and wear it myself. And then I will just be in charge. So he cuts off Jerome's face and starts wearing it himself to get himself out of this pickle. But as Caster Troy told us in Face Off, Nothing like having your face cut off to disturb your sleep. And a bit later, Jerome does wake up from being dead, albeit minus a face. He quickly tracks down Dwight and kills him and retrieves his own face and staples it back onto his head. Jerome, now with a very fun appearance, um, picks up where he left off and starts causing just general chaos through Gotham. Uh, he starts by blowing up the power plant. 
Also, since he was in the middle of something when he died, he wants to get back to that unfinished business and kidnaps Bruce Wayne. He brings Bruce to a carnival to kill him, because remember, he's definitely not the Joker. They end up fighting in a hall of mirrors, and Bruce is able to beat him and escape him. He thinks about re-killing him, but he stops himself short. Gordon shows up to really save the day and arrest Jerome. And here's a selling point if you ever need to pitch the show to anybody. At one point, Gordon punches Jerome so hard that his face comes off again. Behind you! Jim Gordon punches a guy's face off on the show. What more do you have to say? Season three, part two, Heroes Rise. So after lurking around in the Bruce Wayne storyline for the first half of the season, the court, which is the Court of Owls, by the way, uh, finally start to do stuff. It seems the Court of Owls is a clandestine group of elite Gothamites who have been lurking around behind the scenes, controlling things in Gotham City for at least decades. They were behind Hugo Strange and Indian Hill and all the experiments going on there. And it seems that when Thomas Wayne was looking into the secrets of Indian Hill, they may have been the ones to have him killed. On screen, they're mostly represented by a woman named Catherine, who shows up and seems to kind of be like the leader of the court. So remember the last important thing the court did was kidnap the clone Bruce. So here's part two of that. They kidnap the real Bruce Wayne and replace him with the clone. So people don't know that he's gone. Uh, they send Bruce away somewhere outside of the city, some kind of cell in a, in a mountain somewhere. Bruce tries to escape, but he really just can't. He meets a character who I think on the show they call the Shaman, but I believe is meant to be the character Sensei. And this is where Bruce gets his first kind of Batman training. Sensei trains Bruce in fighting, and he also gives him some kind of weird hallucinogenic drugs. He does this so he can confront his fears and he does learn fighting, but really it's more serving to kind of brainwash him and bring him under his control. Uh, so that's what Bruce is going to be doing for a while. Back in Gotham, there's another Court of Owls guy who's been seen here and there. He seems to be in a position of power along with Catherine. And it turns out he's Frank Gordon, Jim's uncle. It seems that the court really wants to destroy Gotham for reasons. Uncle Frank is really not into this. Also, they want... Frank to recruit Jim to be a member of the court. Frank decides to use this opportunity to make a bold move. Well, Frank tells Jim everything that the court's been doing. You know, he comes clean about everything, tells them that they plan to destroy the city, but he's not really into it and that they're trying to recruit him. And then Uncle Frank kills himself in front of Jim. He does this, making it look like Jim killed him. And since his objections to the let's destroy the city plan were pretty well known, this actually serves to ingratiate Jim into the court, giving him a position to take down the court from within, just like Uncle Frank wanted. Meanwhile, Ed has been gallivanting around town um, he actually started calling himself the Riddler at this point. Like, there's an episode around this point where that's titled How the Riddler Got His Name. Riddler decides to change careers at this point from political consultant to outright supervillain. And he remembers, oh yeah, I found out about a secret organization last year. I should try to take them out. So he's going to go after the Court of Owls and he gets his friends Butch, Barbara, and Tabitha to help him out. Also, since we've now seen that shooting someone and throwing them a river is a notoriously bad way to kill someone, the penguin is alive. This time he was rescued and taken to recover by Ivy Pepper. Ah yes, remember Ivy Pepper, the child. Remember last time we crossed her path, she faced down a murder attempt by aging and fell into a sewer pipe. Well, it turns out that brief encounter with the metahuman wasn't enough to kill her, but it did age her enough to turn her into a full-grown adult right away. So we have a new actress playing her as well. It's kind of a long way to go to course correct for initially casting Poison Ivy as a child, but here we are. She happens to find Penguin and collects him to go recover. Also, since as far as the public's concerned, he just vanished, he's no longer the mayor at this point. Again, the political system in Gotham is supposed to be insane, but 
what would you expect? Riddler tries to attack the court, but he's immediately caught by Gordon. Uh, Gordon turns him over to the court to gain more favor to take them down from the inside. Now the court is planning to use the Tetch virus to take down the city because apparently we will never get away from this virus business. They somehow got their hands on Hugo Strange after he took off with Fish Mooney, and they break Nathaniel Barnes out of Arkham to get a sample of his blood to populate more virus. Penguin and Ivy get word of this, and I guess just because they don't want millions of people to die, uh, they get Mr. Freeze and Firefly, and they go after the court as well. It goes about as well as Riddler's plan, and Penguin is immediately captured by the court. They're actually locked in the same holding area together. They decide to put their beef aside for the moment and escape from the court. So now they're like rival gang leaders with the goal of taking down the court and incidentally saving the city. Gordon's undercover dealings have gone just about as far as they can go, and he goes ahead and takes the move and arrests Catherine. The police are holding Catherine, but the court sends a fully insane Nathaniel Barnes to break her out and also kill Jim Gordon. However, Gordon survives the attack, but a rampaging Barnes ends up killing Catherine instead. Before she died, though, Catherine intimated that she isn't really the leader of the court and there are people above her, so the give Gotham the Rage Plague virus plan is still in effect, even though she's dead. Around this time, Lee decides to start looking into the Tetch virus. With everything going on, there's obviously a big push to figure this out and like get a cure for it. She goes to Arkham to talk to Jervis Tetch, and during their interview, he ends up admitting, yeah, I totally gave your husband, the rage virus, Jim wasn't making that up at all. Lee is pretty upset by this news because Mario got the virus trying to save her, presumably during the tea party incident. And then she didn't believe Jim that he was trying to save her. So she feels guilty about the whole situation. She's so upset by this that she makes the, let's just say, interesting decision to infect herself with the Tetch virus and just go wild. Her first act, while crazy and empowered, is to literally bury Jim alive uh, with a vial of the virus, telling him, if you want to get out of here, you're going to have to infect yourself with the virus and dig your way out, and then we can be crazy together. Gordon has no choice but to actually do this and then just kind of fight off the crazy-making side of the virus while also getting some super strength. Now, these two specific folks having the virus is about to become way less important because Bruce Wayne is back in town and he's fully brainwashed by the court and sensei. They've made a virus bomb that they plan to detonate in the city and they want Bruce to do it. Alfred shows up and tries to save Bruce. Uh, by the way, Alfred eventually figured out that the clone Bruce was a clone and the clone just sort of took off. Uh, Selina actually figured this out first, but uh, the Bruce clone threw her out a window. I won't let you tell Alfred. Yeah? How are you gonna stop? Ivy healed her with some plant knowledge, so she's okay again. Anyway, Alfred kills Sensei, but he's not able to do this before him and Bruce detonate the virus bomb. And so now there's hundreds of people who are infected with the virus running around the city and they need a cure right now. Around this time, Fish Mooney comes back. She's able to nab Hugo Strange and teams up with Penguin. They figure that since he weaponized the virus, he probably made a cure for it at the same time, and it turns out they're right. Strange takes Team Penguin off to where he has the cure stashed, and it seems like they're gonna be able to cure the virus while at the same time take over the city, but they're ambushed by a group of masked ninjas for some reason. Gordon and Bullock follow all the commotion, figuring that's where the cure is gonna be, and again, they're right as well, and they get there in time to help fight off the ninjas. Gordon is actually quite adept at using his super abilities and fighting off these ninjas, but he gets a little carried away and accidentally stabs and re-kills Fish Mooney. Okay, we need to save some space so Fish is going back where she was. She was carrying all of the vials of the virus cure at the time, so she drops them and they're all destroyed. 
But the police do manage to arrest the rest of the Penguin Gang and get Hugo Strange. They want him to make more of the antidote, and he can do it, but they need Jervis Tetch so they can get some more blood. Team Riddler hears about this, and so they break Jervis out of jail, grab him first so they can make a power play. Now you might be surprised by the masked ninja showing up out of nowhere, but if you put all the pieces together it might sound a little bit familiar. You got a secret organization trying to destroy the city to make it better. You got Bruce Wayne being groomed for a position of power. You got masked ninja assassins, if you will. Yeah, it turns out it's the League of Shadows and Ra's al Ghul is here. Indeed, when Sensei died, he told Bruce to find the demon's head, so those in the know knew that this was coming. And yes, they call themselves the League of Shadows here, but to me, they will always be the League of Assassins. Whatever. Bruce does track down Raish, who's hanging out at a Lazarus pit in Gotham. It seems that Raish has been behind the court the whole time, and he wants to, Bruce to be his heir as the new demon's head. Alfred shows up to try and help out, but Bruce is still brainwashed enough that he gets into a fight with him and kills Alfred with a sword. This is traumatic enough to snap Bruce out of the conditioning, so he's uh, immediately very sad that he just killed Alfred. But Raish is like, don't worry about it, there's a Lazarus pit right there, you can save him using that. So Raish disappears and Bruce is able to save Alfred's life with the Lazarus pit. Now, we're, I'm not gonna put Alfred on the board here because when they save him, Alfred still needs to go to a hospital and recover it, so I don't think he fully died. Meanwhile, uh, Team Riddler has the Mad Hatter and they plan to ransom him to the city so the city can make an antidote for the virus. Jim knows that Penguin and Riddler are, are in a blood feud at this point, so he makes some changes to the plan and says, hey, I will just give you Penguin in exchange for the Mad Hatter. Now over on Team Riddler, Barbara gets really upset about this because she just wanted the money for the ransom. Now they meet for the hostage exchange and it goes haywire because Barbara spoils it because she's mad about the terms being changed. Uh, but in all the fracas, uh, Jim is able to grab Tetch, pulls him aside, cuts his neck open, and is able to fill a mason jar full of his blood to take back to make a cure out of. Now it might sound like Jim just killed Jervis there, but he was actually okay when the rest of the criminals found him. I guess it wasn't that bad of a slice to the neck. Hugo Strange makes up the cure for him, and uh, Gordon is able to cure himself and leave first before the effects of the virus become irreversible. Presumably they then mass produce the cure and they're able to save the rest of the city. With all the shenanigans of the hostage exchange, Penguin was able to grab Riddler and they took him to the docks again. Penguin had Ivy and Freeze show up and instead of killing Riddler outright, he had Freeze freeze him into a block of ice. Also, the other Team Riddler folks had been really uneasy the whole time. So Barbara was all about working with Riddler, like she didn't care. But Butch and Tabitha had gotten back together and they were pretty uneasy about working with them because of the whole cutting off Tabitha's hand by mistake thing. Ultimately, Butch and Tabitha had planned to kill Barbara because of her poor decision making. After the hostage debacle, Barbara got wise about this, was able to catch up with Butch on his own and shoots him in the head and kills him. Barbara then confronts Tabitha to finish her off too, but Tabitha is able to fight back, ends up electrocuting Barbara and kills her instead. You got a two for this time. So the Riddler team did not go well. At the end of the season, Tabitha has the hot potato nightclub to herself and she's joined by Selina, who she's going to take under her wing, I guess. Lee Tompkins ends up leaving Gotham again. Presumably she's pretty embarrassed about the whole injecting myself with supervillain virus thing. And Bruce knows that Ra's al Ghul is out there, and so he's coming after him. Bruce decides to use his league training to go full on, I'm gonna go out at night and fight crime as a masked vigilante. Season four. Season four goes back to one subtitle for the whole season, which I guess is technically a first since mob shenanigans is just my term. But anyway, and that subtitle is A Dark Night. Because they really want to tell the audience this is a Batman show and they're done being shy about it. 
So where are we at the beginning of the season? Bruce Wayne is out actively being a crime fighter. Uh, Lucius Fox even gives him a suit to do it. I don't think he has a cape or anything, but you know. Gordon is still on the force, which considering his track record is kind of impressive. Also at some point along the last season with Barnes going crazy, they made Bullock the acting chief, so now he's just the chief still. Now the big thing that happened over the break is Gotham has a new mayor, again. And the mayor has made an interesting deal with the Penguin, who is back in power again. Simply put, they've legalized crime. Let me explain. Presumably, the thinking is here that crime is going to happen anyway. The city may as well take steps to make it as safe and as undisruptive as possible. So if you want to commit sanctioned crime, you buy a license from the Penguin and presumably you share some of your ill-gotten gains with him. If you have this license, you agree to be somewhat less violent and in return, the police will not arrest you. Surprisingly, even by Gotham City standards, this is a policy that has been put into place by elected officials and for the most part, the police are falling in line with it. Except for Gordon, of course. He's still arresting people regardless of their licensure, but they're being immediately released and Gordon is catching backlash for it. So Gordon's looking for a way out of this situation. Jim's idea for figuring out this penguin situation is his old standby, asking notorious crime boss Carmine Falcone for help. Falcone is retired to Florida. That's not a joke, that's actually where he went. And so Jim goes to visit him for help. Carmine has no interest in helping. He just wants to kind of kick back and enjoy his retirement. But he seems to be okay with Jim at this point, which considering he, you know, killed his son, um, the trip could have gone worse is all I'm saying. However, while there, Gordon meets Carmine's daughter, Sophia Falcone, and they get into a little chatty flirty. This proves fruitful later on when Sophia comes to Gotham to take back some of the old Falcone territory and to date Jim Gordon. I'm not positive if while they're dating he knows that she's actively involved in crime or not. As mentioned before, Penguin is returned to running the crime world and he is gaining control of the nightclub at this point, the hot potato. And so since Penguin has it, it's officially the Iceberg Lounge now. Following up from the finale, Penguin has Riddler encased in the big block of ice on display in the Iceberg Lounge for everybody to see and to be warned. The ice prison doesn't last long though. Uh, we meet somebody new named Myrtle Jenkins. She's apparently a huge Riddler fan and she rescues him from the block of ice. Uh, to thank her for freeing him from the block of ice, Riddler does nothing actually. He brushes off Myrtle and just takes off to go wander the streets of Gotham. Myrtle is actually captured by Victor Zaz on Penguin's behest and is immediately killed. So as a side effect of being frozen ice, the Riddler doesn't have his smarts anymore. He can still like function normally, but he doesn't have the advanced intellect they did before. He can't do Riddler stuff. For the time being, he's just wandering the streets of the city. Now to catch up with Tabitha and Selina, they're still hanging out together. They obviously don't have the hot potato lounge anymore, uh, but they're hanging out around the city when they run into Barbara? Yes, it's Barbara, who is alive. Now, watching this for the first time, I was like, I'm pretty positive that she died before. Like, was electrocuted to death. And she was. I was questioning my own recollection. I was like, well, maybe she was electrocuted, but we didn't see her die. But she seemed pretty dead back last season. But she seems to be doing pretty fine now. And heck, how many people have come back alive at this point? Why not Barbara? Let me get the board. Tabitha takes this news pretty well, considering she's the one who did the killing. And I guess they're all square now because of Barbara killing Butch and Tabitha killing Barbara, because there seems to be no ill will between them. So I guess if Barbara's okay with it, then no hard feelings, because Barbara teams up with them and they become a trio to do crime. So that's where all of our pieces are at the beginning of the season, but it doesn't take long to get one more thing. So remember Butch, who was shot squarely in the head last season? Apparently, he didn't die. At least not all the way. 
he seems to be brain dead in a hospital somewhere. We find this out because apparently the hospital wants to free up bed space and they're just going to dump Butch into a swamp. If this is actual policy at any hospitals, please let us know in the comments. Around all this hospital administration, we actually find out something interesting. Butch Gilzean isn't his real name. His real name is Cyrus Gold. And watching this the first time, I was like, are they doing this? They're doing this? They're doing this. So if you don't know, Cyrus Gold is the real name of Solomon Grundy. Yeah, this Solomon Grundy. Remember when the show was about mobsters? So they dump Butch into Slaughter Swamp, which is full of chemicals and weird stuff. And a little bit later, he comes back to life as Solomon Grundy. His skin is all super pale white. His hair is all white and wild. His hand grew back, which is nice, but he's lost his mind. He certainly doesn't have any memories or sense of self. So he does what everyone does when they have nothing else to do in the city and he just starts wandering the streets. Totally randomly, he runs into another person who's just wandering the streets at this point, Riddler. Riddler immediately recognizes him as Butch, but he sees all the changes that have happened. He also has super strength now as well, and Riddler notices this. Riddler realizes this could be handy, and he takes Grundy under his wing. Riddler and Grundy, now known as Team Wander the Streets, wander their way into an underground fight club in the Narrows. Riddler has the idea to enter Grundy into these fights, to win money, and he does exactly this. We also discover that the doctor who's attending to the fighters in this underground fight club is Lee Tompkins, who apparently, after leaving Gotham, came back, and but was still feeling bad about the whole inject self with virus and try to kill a bunch of people thing, and so is trying to help out the community by providing medical aid to people in the Narrows. I believe a lot of them like lost their homes after the virus bomb went off or something like that. So she's trying to give back there, and she's using the money from the Fight Club to fund her underground clinic. Riddler seizes on this, and he gets Lee to help him find a cure for his lack of smarts by giving her money from Grundy's Fight Club winnings. So they form into a kind of a, an alliance there. Now we'll get back to the Fight Club team in a, in a little bit. So remember Rachel Ghoul is hanging around town? He's still here, and he's hanging out with Barbara now. So yes, she did die, but she was resurrected by the Lazarus Pit, and so Raish is working with her now to do stuff. There's a charity auction in town, because charity auctions are the height of entertainment in Gotham City, and there's a magic knife on auction that Raish wants to get his hands on. He sends Barbara to go buy the knife, but Bruce gets wind of this since he's on Raish's tail, and he swoops in and buys the magic knife instead. Raish makes a half-hearted effort to steal the knife from Bruce, but it doesn't work and he ends up getting arrested. And as you might expect, when Ra's al Ghul gets arrested by the GCPD, he did it on purpose. Barbara goes to visit Ra's in prison and we learn that the magic knife is something that can kill the demon's head and then pass along the mantle to whoever did the killing. So that's why Ra's wants it. So we get that bit of information and we know that Ra's wants Bruce to be his successor. However, during that prison visit, they I think they do like a little hand on the glass thing and Raish kind of puts some kind of whammy onto Barbara, but it kind of ends at that and Raish sends her on her way. Since this is all part of Raish's plan, he manipulates Bruce to attack him in the prison. They get into a fight and Bruce resists at first, but after a few like insults and taunts thrown his way, Bruce loses a little bit. He attacks and stabs and kills Raish with the magic knife. Straight up, no accident, clean finish. He kills Ra's al Ghul, just like Ra's wanted. Ra's al Ghul, man. Now, Bruce is pretty upset by this. If you think about it though, he did the thing that he set out to do. The Waynes were killed by Matches Malone. Matches was hired by the Court of Owls. The Court of Owls was run by the League of Shadows. The League of Shadows was run by Ra's al Ghul. So like he got to the end of it and he, he, he killed Ra's. But the whole killing thing doesn't sit very well with him, so he gets very depressed. 
At this point, Bruce starts drinking and partying and just going about aimlessly. He fires Alfred again at this point. It seems like his crime fighting days are over. And so we should recall at this point that this show is supposed to be about the police. So there's a new villain in town, Professor Pig. His whole thing is to kidnap and kill corrupt cops along with a generally creepy pig slash butcher motif. Bullock is one of the cops that Pig almost kills. He gets away. But on a later outing where Pig is holding a couple of cops hostage, Bullock charges in a bit too rashly and ends up shooting some of the cops himself. Luckily, Gordon is there, kind of takes control of the situation, and they're actually able to save the lives of the cops being held hostage. Now, Bullock is pretty shaken by all of this, and because of that, he steps down as the captain. And due to his heroics during that raid, Jim is made the new captain of the GCPD. Now, Jim is suspicious about this promotion, maybe because of his track record of leaving the force at any given time, but he thinks that something's up. He correctly suspects that his girlfriend, Sophia Falcone, helped convince the mayor to make him the new chief. He does not like this, and he breaks up with Sophia. He, he stays being chief, though. So you can see Sophia has been making moves in politics and in the criminal underworld to kind of take back her father's old empire. She eventually gets Penguin's attention and we have a good old fashioned mob war on our hands again. Except this time we have several supervillains on hand to make it a bit more fun. There's a whole convoluted subplot about an orphan kid being used as a pawn between Penguin and Sophia, but no need to get into that. Just know that they're fighting. With the war heating up, Penguin hires Barbara, Tabitha, and Selina, known as the Sirens, uh, to go find Riddler because he might be useful in the fights that are ramping up. They end up finding Riddler in the fight club in the Narrows, and they, especially Tabitha, recognizes Butch as Grundy, or Grundy as Butch, I should say. In the commotion, the person who's leading the fight club, her name is Cherry, she ends up getting killed. Really? Cherry? Does Cherry go on the board? Who's Cherry? Nobody I know, but I guess fair is fair. And with Cherry dead, since she's the closest thing to a functioning adult in the Narrows, it would seem, they put Lee in charge of the Fight Club and, by proxy, just in charge of the Society of the Narrows. So she is in charge of the whole area now. Again, in the fracas while they're visiting slash murdering, Grundy ends up taking a hard shot to the head. And when he does this, he seems to recognize Tabitha. Tabitha picks up on this, so later she comes back and kidnaps Grundy so she can try and uh, get his old memories back. Her process involves hitting him in the head a bunch in hopes that it will eventually jog his memory, the Gilligan's Island method. And it works. She hits him in the head enough to where he remembers his old life as Butch. Which, if you're keeping track, makes three separate occasions where Butch was held captive had horrible violence inflicted on him to bring about some kind of psychological change in four seasons. So going back to the other side of things, once war were declared, uh, Carmine Falcone finally decides to come back to Gotham to put a stop to it. And no sooner does he arrive than he's killed in an explosion. We have a season and a half left here. I'm not sure if we have all the space that we need, but we will give it a try. Sophia is also hurt in the explosion, but she survives. Everybody immediately suspects the Penguin of blowing him up. Even people who are under his employ, like Victor Zaz, who still has a soft spot for the Falcone family and Carmine personally. Penguin claims not to be responsible, but he's quickly arrested and thrown in jail because people like Victor Zaz are willing to turn on him and testify to the police because they think that he killed Carmine. So it looks like Sophia is going to come out on top of all of this, and once again, Gordon is suspicious. He goes to visit Sophia, and she admits to orchestrating everything. Professor Pig's antics, uh, that orphan subplot, uh, Carmine's assassination, all of it was orchestrated by her so she could seize control of the city. Professor Pig even shows up at this point and is revealed that he's directly employed by Sophia the whole time. Sophia then kills Pig so Gordon can take the credit for stopping him and making the cops safe again. 
thus cementing his power within the GCPD. Oh yeah, there was another episode in there somewhere where Professor Pig embarked on another cannibalism plot, which would be two for this show, but it's not important he's dead now. Gordon really doesn't see that he has all, any alternatives to this, so he just sort of goes along with Sophia's machinations. So now that Sophia is in charge of crime, she turns her attention to the Narrows, where Lee is trying to run a somewhat peaceful society. I don't know why. I guess they just seem to have a pretty well organized, like, underground society, and Sophia sees this as a threat to her own governance. Whatever. We have Toy Man show up and try to kill Lee. It actually turns out this is a plot by the Riddler. So it seems that the Riddler's loss of his smarts weren't physiological as they were just psychological. And his alternate personality sort of split off again and was jealous of his growing affection toward Lee and so tried to kill Lee without the main personality knowing. Anyway, that plot is foiled, but the plot serves to tell Jim Gordon that Hey, Lee's been in town this whole time because he had no idea before that. But uh, Sophia is still trying to take out Lee and the Narrows. Uh, Penguin has ended up in Arkham because apparently due process isn't exactly a thing in Gotham City. While Penguin is in Arkham, he runs into Jerome, who seems to be plotting a kind of escape from Arkham. More on that later. Penguin convinces Riddler to help him escape in exchange for his help with his own war against Sophia. So Penguin, Riddler, and Lee are all planning to move against Sophia, but it seems that Sophia has had a spy in Penguin's organization all along. Penguin's accountant, a guy named Arthur Penn, has been feeding Sophia information the whole season, so they don't really make any headway. However, Gordon learns about Penn, and he sees Penn as a way to take down Sophia to prove that she was behind Pig and her father's death and everything. They try to secure Penn as a witness, but things go horribly wrong. And uh, Sophia ends up shooting Gordon multiple times and plans to kill him. But luckily, Lee shows up at this point and shoots Sophia straight in the head. You. Yeah. Me. And I'm not even going to go to the board on this one because one scene later they explained that she did not die and she is in fact in a coma. Sophia? In a coma. Amazing she's not dead. I guess if Butch can get shot in the head and survive, then so can Sophia. And yes, I know you can get shot in the head without dying, but it seems unusual. And why not kill Sophia? Like, death is no deterrent to anything in the show at this point. And also, spoilers for the rest of the show, she doesn't come back, so she may as well be dead. But I guess they, you just keep her alive in case you ever need to go back to the well at some point in the future. But Sophia is out of the picture, and maybe things will get a little bit more peaceful. They don't. So now, before moving to the end of season four, we should catch up on Bruce's story. So after killing Rachel Ghoul, Bruce was depressed at being a drunken party boy. Uh, but he gets snapped out of it after he's captured and almost killed, along with Lucius Fox, by Poison Ivy. Oh yeah, Poison Ivy is in this show, and more Poison Ivy than ever. So remember at the end of last season when Ivy was with Penguin? Uh, she was with Penguin at the beginning of this season as well, but really quickly fell out of favor with him and got kicked out of the lounge. She went searching for something to make her stronger. There was no particular meaning behind this stronger that she was looking for. She was looking for something. She went to a shop that sells magical and mystical herbs and potions. She ended up killing the shop owner and just like drinking random chemicals in hopes that they would make her stronger. No! She keels over immediately and might be dead. She emerges weeks later from a plant pod as full-on poison ivy and is a different actress. She's transformed again and now has the plant powers that we've come to expect from poison ivy. She goes on a killing spree for some reason, including trying to kill Bruce, something to do with the, her plants and the Lazarus pit, but she's eventually 
uh, convinced to stop murdering by Selena. Anyway, that brush with death snapped Bruce out of his depression. So after all this Falcone family drama, we move into our big finale that has nothing to do with them. So remember Jerome was playing an escape from Arkham? Uh, he ended up teaming up with Mad Hatter and Scarecrow, and they ended up escaping. Oh yeah, Scarecrow's back. Back at the beginning of the season, there were some criminals who broke Jonathan Crane out of Arkham. Remember, he got dosed with the, the super fear toxin by his dad way back in season one. So now he was full-on Scarecrow and making fear toxin himself and ready to cut it up on the supervillain scene. But the GCPD caught him and they threw him back in Arkham. So Jerome is leading this group because he seems to want to go after someone. He seems to want to get Bruce Wayne still, but there's also somebody he's after named Xander Wilde. He gets some more recruits after he gets out of Arkham. So we have a team consisting of Scarecrow, Mad Hatter, Mr. Freeze, Firefly, Penguin, Solomon Grundy, and Jerome, who's definitely not the Joker, all coming together to do crime. So it turns out that Xander Wilde is an alias of Jeremiah Valeska, the twin brother of Jerome, also played by Cameron Monaghan. Apparently, Jeremiah was the sane brother who got away from the circus and has made a very successful career for himself as a cutting edge architect. He's super smart and he knows that Jerome is after him. So he actually works with the police to evade Jerome's plans. At this point, Jerome gets mad and he plans to take a music festival hostage in exchange for Bruce Wayne and Jeremiah. Penguin and Grundy get word that that's not really the plan. He isn't really planning to exchange them. He just wants to kill all the people at the music festival. So they back out and they tell Gordon about the plot. So the police show up, they manage to foil Jerome's plot. Gordon tries to run him down to arrest him, but Jerome ends up allowing himself to fall off a building rather than be captured by Gordon and plummets to his second death. <laughs> oh, heck, I forgot to take Jerome off the first time. Well, I'm going to make this official. Again, since we're running out of space. But around this same time, uh, Jerome managed to find out where Jeremiah was hiding out. He had Scarecrow cook up a batch of super duper fear toxin slash crazy making gas and delivered it to Jeremiah in a jack-in-the-box. Apparently Jeremiah isn't quite as smart as he seemed and he opened up the jack-in-the-box and got a dose of crazy gas to the face. seemingly driving him insane. While this has been going on, the League of Shadows is back. Remember in prison when Raish put the whammy on Barbara? Apparently this passed the demon's head essence into her. So now the League is tracking her down to make her the new leader. But I guess the League is super sexist and a lot of them won't accept a woman as their leader. A lot of them, but not all of them. You'd think they had had this discussion before they all traveled to Gotham, but apparently they didn't. Because immediately all of the female League members turn on all the male members and kill them all and say like, yeah, we don't have a problem with Barbara being in charge. You're in charge now. And so Barbara is their leader now. Now Tabitha is really apprehensive about Barbara being in charge of the League of Shadows. And so she's courted and recruited by, I guess we have to call them the sexist branch of the League. And their plan is to use Bruce Wayne's blood to resurrect the old Rachel Ghoul, which I'm pretty sure is also the plot of Legend of Zelda 2. Since Bruce is the one who used the magic knife to kill him, this should bring him back. And it does. <laughs> they get Bruce's blood and they manage to resurrect the previous Rachel Ghoul. <laughs> I had a feeling this one wouldn't last. So we have a little civil war that breaks out in the league between the people who are behind Barbara and the people who are behind Raish. Um, it doesn't last very long because Raish immediately threatens to kill Tabitha if Barbara doesn't hand over the essence of the demon's head back to him so he can be like the real leader. And so she acquiesces and gives it back. 
and so he is the undisputed Ra's al Ghul again. Back to Jeremiah Valeska, he's full crazy now, but he's a lot more thoughtful and measured than Jerome was. The crazy making gas also gave him a very pale complexion, but remember, not the Joker. So Jeremiah has a plan for Gotham now. Uh, before he went crazy, he had invented these like energy cells that he could use to power the buildings that he designed. And uh, so now that he's crazy, he's modified them to be bombs. We saw before that he really was into mazes. And so he's going to use these bombs to collapse a bunch of high rises in Gotham City to turn it into a giant maze for fun, I guess. Now, Ra's al Ghul learns about Jeremiah's plan. He's like, hey, destroying Gotham is our whole thing here at the League. Like, we're in. Let, let's get in on this. Everyone else is against the whole destroying the city plan. So we get everybody versus Jeremiah and Ra's and the League. Initially, they are successful at disarming the bombs so all the buildings don't come down. Jeremiah gets arrested briefly, but Raish and the League um, quickly break him out. During all of this commotion, Jeremiah ends up shooting Selina and paralyzing her. Because remember, he's not the Joker. Now the bombs are still in play, so Raish actually does manage to reset the bombs and actually detonates them this time. It doesn't do the exact thing that Jeremiah wanted them to and make the city do maze, but it does function to cut off the city from the mainland. So they're isolated within the city. But after blowing up a good portion of the city, the gang is able to track down Raish again. They get the magic knife, and this time, Barbara and Bruce, like both holding onto it, they team up to stab Raish again and re-kill him. And from a larger Batman mythos perspective, I guess since Bruce's original killing of Raish was undone, and then this time he had help from Barbara, you can put a, still put an asterisk on the Batman doesn't kill thing and it would still sort of work, but that's only if you really want to. So the immediate threat is over, but the city is still in shambles. A lot of it got blown up by the bombs and they are cut off, like they can't get help from the mainland right away. Jeremiah just escaped, so he is out there somewhere. Bruce and Gordon vow to stay behind to help save the city as our season comes to a close. And to just wrap up with our other friends, Penguin tracks down Hugo Strange again to fix Grundy. I'm not exactly sure what needs fixing since he has his memories back, but they want to degrundify him and turn him back into Butch proper. Strange succeeds and he turns Butch back into Butch. And Penguin immediately kills Butch. Uh, sorry, Butch, your spot got taken over, so you're gonna have to have a new one. And why did Penguin just kill him? As revenge against Tabitha for killing Penguin's mom. Oh yeah, remember way back in season two, Tabitha was the specific person who killed Penguin's mom, and I guess he's had a grudge all this time. And so they went through the, the effort to de-Grundy Butch just so he could kill him in front of Tabitha to get revenge. Finally, Lee and Riddler, they've been getting pretty close in the Narrows this whole time. Ed has been really into her and strangely, Lee has seemed to be attracted to Enigma as well. There's a lot of drama between them and you know, there's still stuff with Gordon going on in the background. So it's not a great coupling. All this culminates when Lee had planned to leave the city with Ed. That's one of her favorite pastimes after all. But when the bombs went off, she decides to stay behind and help out. Lee and Ed get into a fight over this and they stab each other to death. Like they both pull knives, stab each other, share a kiss and then collapse. Now, I'm not even going for it because I double checked. So Penguin or his guys came upon their bodies after the whole stabbing had gone down and apparently had them collected and sent to Hugo Strange with the directive to fix them. And I checked and in that scene, they are both still breathing. So I'm just gonna go ahead and assume that they did not die and Hugo Strange simply helped them to not die instead of going the full resurrection route, which we know we can do. So that's where we leave season four. Uh, for those of you in the know, you might recognize this setup as no man's land, where Gotham is cut off from the rest of the country and kind of left on its own. So we have a really clear direction going into the final season. The villains are dividing up the city between themselves and Gordon's there to try and stop them. Also, Man Bat shows up for no reason. 
I guess there were plans for Man Bat to be part of season five, but those sort of fell through and they were never realized. So in the season four finale, we get a random shot of Man Bat that's never followed up on. Season five. We're in the home stretch now. This last season was a bit shortened, came in about 13 episodes, which seems reasonable, but remember, you know, we're used to having like 20 plus episodes a season, so it's a shorter one. This season's subtitle is Legend of the Dark Knight because, again, they just really want you to know this is a Batman show. The subtitle probably should have just been No Man's Land because, again, they're using that comic arc where Gotham was cut off by an earthquake, I believe, and separated from the mainland, but here it's because of the bombs that Raish detonated. So to catch up, it's been three months since the, the bomb incident went down, and the government has, I guess, deemed it too dangerous to reconnect with Gotham. I guess they've been sending supplies, but you can't just go to and from the city. Within the city, there's no centralized government, which you might ask, well, how is this different than it was before? But we'll just have to take their word that there was a functioning government in the city in the before times. The city has been split up into territories controlled by different gangs or groups. I can go to my notes here. You have Gordon running the GCPD territory and generally trying to supply aid and keep the peace. Then you have Penguin, Barbara, Scarecrow, Mr. Freeze, and Firefly all running different parts of the city. They're all jockeying and fighting, trying to like take over more territory and control more of the city. Why they're doing this instead of anybody just trying to escape, I can't tell you. Jeremiah is also presumably still out there, but he has not been heard of since the bomb incident. For other friends, Selena is still paralyzed after she was shot by Jeremiah uh, last year. Bruce is still there to take care of her. Bruce and Alfred have been able to like go to and from Wayne Manor with like a secret tunnel. Secret tunnel! Why nobody uses that to, you know, leave the city? Again, I don't know. And uh, Riddler's around again. After almost being killed by Lee, he's gone back to his old pastime of just wandering around the city. Except this time, he's taken to blacking out and just coming to in random parts of the city with no memory of how he got here or there. You might think, oh, it's his multiple personalities coming back in, but nope, this is something different. So Gordon has been keeping in touch with the mainland slash military and somebody named Walker to try and to reunify the city with the rest of the country. I guess the idea is they need to bring the city under some kind of control before the government will intervene and, you know, hook them back up again, which seems like a pretty bootstrappy plan to give them, but what? As such, the GCPD controlled area of the city, they've set up uh, like apartments for people who are not involved in the gang warfare and you're just trying to live peacefully. The GCPD is also in a way fighting for territory itself to bring the gangs under heel. And apropos of nothing, unfortunately, there's a random gunfight early on and we need to take out the board because I believe it's Barbara and Penguin's gang get into just a random gunfight and Tabitha is shot and killed. You didn't expect Tabitha to make it this far. It's a pretty good run for like a random season two character. And yeah, that doesn't really lead to anything or tie into anything. So just RSVP Tabitha. Anyway, to say that there's tension between the gangs is an understatement. And at one point there's a group of gang members that are killed and Penguin is blamed for it. Really, it was Riddler who killed these gang members, uh, but he doesn't know it and nobody else knows it. Only we the audience know it. This brings a lot of heat on Penguin and it leads to a confrontation between Penguin and the GCPD team at the GCPD apartments. It looks like there's going to be a big battle, but fortunately it's averted. However, while everybody is standing there, a rocket gets fired in the apartment building and just blows up the whole thing. Hundreds of people are killed. Luckily, considering the show that we've been watching, this is treated like a huge deal and there is outcry for whoever is responsible for it. Victor Zaz is believed to be the culprit and he is brought up in a kind of a trial, but Gordon immediately recognizes that the evidence against him is pretty trumped up and he probably didn't do it and he manages to save Victor from getting killed. 
but the public is still really mad about this and they are looking for someone to take the blame for it. And since Gordon stuck his neck out, like he is facing a lot of uh, pressure to find out what really caused all these deaths. Gordon is so crushed by all of this that he ends up getting drunk one night and hooks up with Barbara, which may be the worst decision in the history of this show. And you see what all we've been through and I would still argue, yes bad decision. It's hard to think of one that's worse. A Riddler gets on the case of who blew up the apartment and he finds out it was himself. He discovers that during one of his blackouts he was the one who got up and fired the rocket into the building. As you can understand, he keeps this information to himself. Things are looking really rocky for the GCPD, but uh, Walker, the lady who Gordon's been talking to on the radio, decides to send in some reinforcements. They're a group of mercenaries who are led by Eduardo Dorrance, who is one of Jim's old military buddies. So this is great. You know, the mercenaries provide a stabilizing force to the GCPD and they bring in supplies with them. So this is, this is a good thing. Unfortunately, Eduardo is almost immediately revealed to be a bad guy. There's only 13 episodes here, remember. So remember when Ed and Lee were taken to Hugo Strange to save them after the stabbing? Apparently he fixed them up, but took the opportunity to put a mind control brain chip into Ed's head. And whenever he's been blacking out, that's him being controlled to take actions like killing the gang members and firing the rocket. Lucius Fox figures out that Ed was behind the apartment attack and that he's being controlled by Eduardo. Immediately, Ed is dispatched to kill Gordon, uh, but Gordon's able to fight him off and destroys the brain chip in his head. So between Ed's testimony and Lucius's findings, they have enough evidence to expose that Eduardo and by that extension, Walker, have been trying to cause chaos instead of solve it. Now, Eduardo reveals a trump card. He also has Lee held captive with a brain control chip in her head too. Briefly, a couple things here. I don't know why Eduardo shows off that he has Leslie as a weapon, but he doesn't use her as a weapon. It's like, look at this fancy weapon that I have. I'm not gonna use it, but here, look at it. You know, you, you would have imagined he could have had a you know an agent inside of Gordon's GCPD to feed information, but nope, didn't do that. Also, how weird is it that we have mind control chips, but not a word about Mad Hatter in this angle. Gordon fights Eduardo at the wreckage of the apartment building. Gordon's able to beat him and impales him on a pipe. Um, he doesn't die, but he just kind of leaves him there impaled. They're able to get control of the brain chips and disable them. They remove the chip from Lee. So now Lee and Gordon have been reunited as well. So things are looking better. Oh, but uh, now Barbara is pregnant with Jim's baby. Way to go, Jim. So meanwhile, Bruce has been trying to help Selena, but traditional medicine is not helping her regain her ability to walk. He goes to Poison Ivy to get a magic seed to heal her. This works. She regains her ability to walk and also gains some kind of cat powers. The legacy of Catwoman having ill-defined cat power from Batman Returns lives on. Selena sets out to find Jeremiah to get revenge for shooting her. The rumor is that he has been kidnapping slash recruiting people to build a tunnel to go under the river to escape the city, which somehow makes him the sanest person in the city at this point. But Selena tracks him down. They're able to find Echo, who is an assistant working for Jeremiah. We actually met Echo before when Jeremiah was still sane. She was his assistant then, and it seems he's still with him now. I think there's some dialogue to suggest or just say that he may have shot her in the head, and so she's a little bit crazy now. And also, she is definitely not Harley Quinn. So all of this tunnel rumor turns out to be true. They're able to track down Jeremiah down there. Selena immediately attacks him and stabs him multiple times. He seems to die and everybody seems to be liberated from the whole tunnel project, but he's just sort of faking it. And it seems that Jeremiah did all of this just draw out Bruce Wayne. He follows Bruce. He ends up using a secret tunnel to go to Wayne Manor and blow it up. So Wayne Manor is destroyed and also the tunnel out of there is destroyed. So Alfred and Bruce are stuck on the mainland. Jeremiah goes all in for Bruce at this point. He kidnaps Lee and Gordon to kind of try and recreate the Wayne's death, just torment Bruce. 
He's also planning to cook up a super batch of chemicals to unleash on the city to kill a bunch of people. And this all leads to a big showdown at Ace Chemicals. And wouldn't you know it, Bruce ends up knocking Jeremiah into a big vat of noxious chemicals. Who would have thunk it? He does not die. We'll get back to that later. But around the same time, we got all this chemical problem to deal with. Gordon ends up having to dump all the chemicals into the river in order to keep them from killing everybody. Unfortunately, they were this close to being able to be reunified with the mainland, and because the river's not full of chemicals, those plans are put on hold. Lucius Fox and Wayne Enterprises are working to filter out the water, but it's still gonna take some time to do that. At this point, there's a lot of time that goes by while they're filtering out the water. And again, the show creators seem to be trying to get as many things in as they could before the show is over. So we'll quickly go through everything here. Jim and Lee get married, so yay. Like not really married because there's no way to legally do that at this point, but you know, Close enough. And apparently Lee is okay that Jim is about to have a baby with his villainous ex, so if she's okay with it, then whatever. Riddler and Penguin get together and decide to build a submarine from scratch so they can escape the city. Why exactly a boat won't work, I'm not sure. Perhaps the military would attack them, but that's the plan. They reveal the supervillain Magpie has been stealing from Penguin as he's been hoarding up riches. They kill her off in the same episode. They reveal the supervillain Jane Doe is targeting Bullock for revenge. And they kill her off in the same episode. They bring back Penguin's accountant, Arthur Penn, and he's revealed to be the ventriloquist, like with the Scarface doll and everything. And they kill him off in the same episode. Ivy has one last hurrah to remind you that she's a character on this show and tries to kill Jim to stop reunification or something. She doesn't, and luckily she doesn't die. She just decides to leave. They reveal that one of the gang leaders in the town is in fact the mutant leader. Like this guy, who is definitely meant to evoke this guy, who is the mutant leader from Dark Knight Returns. This is probably the point that broke me as a viewer, where I really knew what I was watching. I'm pretty sure I rewound the episode going, that's the mutant leader. Obviously, he's not the mutant leader, but in this continuity, he essentially is. And I'm just in awe that they went there. S at some point in the future, they're going to adapt the Dark Knight Returns into a live action something. And the mutant leader is going to be in it. And you can always look back and say, Gotham did it first. So back to the main story. Remember Jim left Eduardo impaled on that pipe? Well, Walker came to collect slash save him and took him to Hugo Strange to fix him up. They didn't go with the brain chips this time and instead saved him by pumping him full of venom. Yep, he's Bane. Finally, after several months, uh, Gordon's been in touch with the real military and unification is almost all set. They're sending in a general Wade to do like a final inspection to make sure things are good to go. I wasn't sure if this was supposed to be General Wade Eiling, as they just call him General Wade, but that's like my best guess. As luck would have it, while the meeting is going on with General Wade, Barbara goes into labor. Also as luck would have it, Bane uses this exact opportunity to attack the GCPD and the general and kidnap Gordon the general to prevent the reunification. So Walker is on the attack because it turns out her name isn't really Walker at all. It's really Nissa Al Ghul, daughter of Ra's al Ghul. So we have league shenanigans going on again. She's doing the whole destroy Gotham thing as well as the get revenge for my dad thing. Thus, we have Bane attacking the hospital where Barbara's in labor. Because remember, Barbara helped kill Raish at the end there. So we're treated to the visual of Barbara pregnant, in labor, in a wheelchair, being wheeled around by Lee, while Barbara dual wields pistols, shooting at Bane and his henchmen. Are about a minute apart. We've got to get you out of here. Remember when this show was about mobsters? Lee and Barbara are able to escape from Bane and Barbara's able to safely deliver the baby. 
Gordon is able to escape from Hugo Strange with the general. But once it seems like they're safe, the general radios up to the military and tells them that Gotham is a lost cause and the plan now is to bomb the city. So it seems that Strange was able to put one of those brain chips into the general while we weren't looking, and Nissa al Ghul is now controlling him. Also, it would seem that the military had this bomb Gotham into oblivion to plan on the table for some reason. So all of our friends have to come together to stop Nissa, Bane, and their military. Riddler and Penguin have their sub done, and they think about escaping, but they decide they want to stay and fight for the city, so they go and there's a big battle that ensues with a giant blockade and gunfire and it just turns into a whole war zone. Elsewhere, Nyssa is able to kidnap Barbara's baby as part of her revenge plot. Gordon and Barbara manage to save their baby um, and they try to apprehend Nyssa, but as a failsafe, Nyssa has the general kill himself. I'm just going to go with the general. Since the general is dead, there's nobody left to call off the bombing raid. Nissa gets stabbed during all of this, but she manages to run off and escapes the city in a homemade submarine that she finds lying around. So a last ditch effort is made by Bruce to blow up the Wayne Enterprises building, you know, collapsing it, kind of like what Jeremiah wanted to do. And that funnels the military force into what will be a final confrontation with the GCPD. The plan is to get as many civilians underground in a way as possible, hopefully to stay safe from the bombs, while the GCPD and their friends fight it out with the military as in their last stand. So they go out to do this, everybody runs away, but then everybody is so moved by their bravery that they all come back and everybody is going to stand and fight the military. And the military apparently is just moved by this. I guess they don't want to just attack civilians, even though that's what they were kind of doing anyway and they decide just not to listen to Bane because there's no other higher ranking officials. Bane was in charge, so they say, no, we're not just not gonna do it. So then it's everybody against Bane and Bane just gives up. You know, he takes stock of the situation and decides, well, I can do nothing here. So he just stops and that's it. They won, they won the battle. There must be enough high ranking officials there that they can call off the bombing at that point because I don't know who was above Bane and the general, but it works and the city is saved. So the city is restored as an actual city. They're reunified with the country. A new mayor is put in place again, and Jim Gordon is made officially the commissioner of police. Bruce Wayne decides that with all the craziness that's been going on, he should probably leave the city. Remember his house got blown up too? I think he says some stuff about all of the destroy the city plots being kind of adjacent to him and maybe he's responsible. So he decides to go travel the world, but I think we all know what he's really up to. Hopefully he bought Alfred a new place to live in the meantime. And for our final episode, we go 10 years later. Gotham has been rebuilt and is doing pretty well. Gordon is still the commissioner and presumably he got officially married to Leah at some point because they are together still. Barbara has helped rebuild the city and is a successful real estate developer despite being a known criminal and murderer somehow. Which is even stranger because it seems Gordon arrested Penguin and Riddler like just months after the last episode. Like they say like within a c three months or something they were arrested and they've been in jail this whole time. Which I know, criminals and murderers, but they did fight side by side along with Jim in, in that final battle. Doesn't feel right. We also find out that Aubrey James is somehow the mayor again. Once again, this city makes no sense. So there's a big party going on because we learned that Wayne Enterprises is opening their new high-rise headquarters and Bruce Wayne is coming back to town. Upon hearing this in Arkham, Jeremiah Valeska rouses from what seemed to be a catatonic state he's been in since he fell in the vat. And he looks kind of familiar now. Echo shows up again to get him out of Arkham and straight up calls him Mr. J. So Jeremiah kidnaps Barbara and Jim's daughter, who they named Barbara Lee, and is holding her hostage at Ace Chemical. Gordon goes to rescue her. Uh, Jeremiah goes on about how he thinks he should go by a new name at this point. 
but he doesn't come up with one in the moment. And before things can go bad, an unseen vigilante saves Barber Jr. from going into another vat of chemicals. Jim is able to apprehend the former Jeremiah. Also, Echo dies. Are we gonna be able to get out of this episode without anybody else dying? We'll see. And in our last shot, we get the people at the Wayne Enterprises party, including a grown-up Selena, getting a glimpse of the Batman. So that's the end of Gotham. They took us right up to the doorstep of Batman. And what a ride it's been. 100 episodes of one hour TV drama. That's massive. And now that I've got a chance to look back, what do I think? Heck yes, I like this show. I've come to realize that early on I was slightly wrong in the way I was looking at this show. I came to it early on with a slightly cynical, oh, you want to do Batman without Batman, but you really want it to be Batman show. We'll see how that goes for you. I definitely should have been more open to just taking the idea behind Batman and running with it. I'd say this show kind of undermines the idea of Batman. Usually, I mean, you have the Waynes killed in this random act of violence. The killer is never brought to justice. So Batman is always fighting against this idea of crime, you know, hoping that the thing that happened to him won't happen to anybody else. But here, we have like a direct line I mentioned before. We had Matches Malone, who was hired by the court, who was hired by the League, who was run by Rachel Ghoul. There's a direct line there. Like, you would think really this would end up with it becoming Bruce Wayne, League Hunter, as he travels the globe fighting the League of Shadows. And that's a neat idea. And you could have done that, but instead you go and end up with the Batman. And that's still okay too, frankly. Halfway through the show, my idea was like, Gordon should be Batman. What if Bruce Wayne dies and then you have Alfred and Gordon kind of coming together and Gordon becomes Batman to like get revenge for the death of Bruce Wayne. Like that would have made sense in the context of the series and like what a neat idea that would have been. We have to take art on its own merits. It's fun to think about the canon and what connects to what and, and how things should be. But ultimately the thing is and should stand on its own. And I was wrong in my initial judgment. This show is just fine in the ways it chose to connect to the old canon. And it was fun. When it's all said and done, the show creators gave us a Batman without Batman and they did a pretty good job of it. They were clearly big fans behind the scenes who were working hard to bring us these fan favorite characters into this network drama setting and they succeeded pretty well. The actors on this show were great across the board. In totality, they're given some pretty wild characters for, to portray and some very silly situations to go through, but they managed to do that while keeping one foot grounded, so ultimately you do kind of care about what happens to these characters. You get to know them and you get to care about them. And I mentioned before the tone of this show, how it vacillates wildly between goofiness and really horrible, grisly violence. But you know, come to think of it, that's probably more in line with the original comic source material than we like to think about. And the way they present it is certainly more palatable than any episode of, like, let's say, Law & Order that I've ever seen. And on that note, while putting this together, and especially considering our Thomas and Martha Wayne Memorial Death Board, I got to thinking, is there any episode of this show where nobody dies? Furthermore, there's a lot of death in this show. I wonder how many people end up dying in this show. Like, you could count that up, but but who would do that? Well, while researching this video, I found pretty quickly that someone had gone through the research and already compiled this list for us. So a special thanks to Crackhead McGee on the fandom wiki for putting this together for us. We thank you for your service. So we're gonna go to the notes here. So Mr. McGee found that out of 100 episodes, there were exactly two where nobody dies. And in all told, in the whole series, there are 1,472 deaths. Now, to be fair, about 300 of those are when the apartment blows up at the end. So even taking that away, that's about 1,100 in the series. So averaging over 10 per episode. And who is our number one offender, you might be wondering? Well, if you take away the outlier, the 300, which, he, which Mr. McGee credits to Eduardo, our number one offender is James Gordon himself with 96 kills, 
almost one per episode. This is the police commissioner in Gotham City. Anyway, this show is great. It's not great in the way like prestige TV is called great anymore, but it's great in that it accomplishes what it sets out to do. Could you do without the mob shenanigans in season one? I could, but uh, to your cousin who's never heard of a Batman and doesn't know what all this is about, maybe that's the kind of easier entryway that gets them into this wackier show where people are getting erased off the death board. Stan Lee famously said that every comic book is somebody's first comic book. Every Batman is somebody's first Batman. And if this show is somebody's first Batman, they could do a heck of a lot worse. If you're intrigued by this video, I say, give it a go. Uh, if you've watched the whole thing and you know the whole story at this point, maybe just start a season two, but whatever sounds good for you. Either way, I think it's still a fun watch. I mean, I said before, if you can think of a Batman villain, there's a 70% chance that they appear on this show at some point. There's lots of relationship drama that only sometimes ends in violent death. Someone turns out to secretly be Solomon Grundy. Jim Gordon punches a guy's face off. Alfred threatens to beat up a kid at least one time that I can remember. Cameron Monaghan is the best Joker who's technically legally not the Joker. The mutant leader. There's one time where Penguin takes a giant dump and breaks Riddler's toilet. They put Man Bat on screen and had the courage to never follow up with it. They had the conviction to canonically recast Poison Ivy twice. There's plenty to love both ironically and sincerely in this show. And so friends, that's what the hell is going on in Gotham. Thanks for watching.